Hi there, this is Justine Priestley, and you are listening to the World Is Wrong podcast. We're here to tell you how the world is wrong. The world is wrong about up against Amanda two with Rissy and Priestley. <laughs> Welcome to The World is Wrong, an extremely positive podcast where we celebrate films and film artists the world is wrong about. (laughs) I don't know why I'm talking like this, but I am. And it's because I'm just giddy with excitement that we get to do a second episode about Up Against Amanda. This isn't going to mean we're going to just keep yip yapping about the film. We actually are interfacing with the world with this podcast. We put it out and the director of Up Against Amanda and its star, Justine Priestley, I mean, Justine Priestley, the star and its director, Michael Rizzi, are, uh, they reached out and they have now been recorded and you're about to hear interviews with both of them about this film where they answer our questions and correct our mistakes. And, uh, <laughs> Brian, you want to say anything to get people in the mood for this? Just uh, if you still haven't seen this movie, it's so good. It's uh, it's one of the best movies I've seen this year. One of the best movies I've seen in a long time. Uh, Up against Amanda. It's on Tubi. You you just listen, like watch it, and then listen to last week's episode and listen to this episode. It's it's exciting. It's very very exciting. Yeah, it get it'll get you inspired about film. Yeah, it will. There might be spoilers. There might be spoilers. There might be spoilers. I uh, appreciate being on your show. Thank you. Thank you. And it's great to have you here. And first off, as much as we uh, clearly love your film, I'm aware we got some of the basic facts about it wrong. Uh, Also about you and about your career, the whole thing. The world is wrong and we're part of that wrong world. So uh, (laughs) would you mind just uh, correcting us for the sake of our audience so that we we can be a little bit less wrong? Uh, Well, I think I should start with the music in the movie um, because I'm related to the person who wrote the music, and that's my Aunt Karen Lawrence, my mother's sister. And she's had a career in the music business for a long time. I think that probably her first major credit that people would take notice of is that she wrote a song for Barbara Streisand. It's called Prisoner, and it was used in a movie that John Carpenter wrote, actually. It's called The Eyes of Laura Mars. Now, I don't know how many people have oh, seen wow. that because... John Carpenter yeah. wrote that? Yes, he did. Wow. Uh, cool. They changed his screenplay quite a bit. But, um, yeah, it's a it's a thriller. And uh, it was directed by Irvin Kirshner, who went on to direct The Empire Strikes Back, which I'm sure most of your listeners are familiar with. One of the best Star Wars movies. Actually, our listeners would know him very well from our coverage of... Never say never again. Uh-huh. But uh, yes, he also is pretty famous for that for that little Star Wars film. Uh, right. <laughs> so he's not as famous for his <laughs> his little thriller there. <laughs> but uh, it's interesting because when the movie ends, the first credit that comes up is Barbara Streisand's credit with my aunt's credit as one of the songwriters right below Barbara Streisand's name. So she's had a, a long and very interesting career. At the time that we made Up Against Amanda, she was in a band called Blue by Nature with a guitarist named Rick Dufay, who had previously worked with uh, Aerosmith, which I think, again, there's another band I think some of your listeners would be familiar with. Oh, yeah. So she's uh, also, I think, uh, had a couple of songs in some other movies. You may know of a John Travolta movie called Perfect. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And one of her songs is in that movie. So um, she also wrote songs for the very first 35 millimeter movie I made called Soul Taker, which I should point out, I did not write Soul Taker. I mean, I added a lot of creative elements to that movie, but that was not my idea. I was brought in to direct that movie because I had, as a student, 
at USC Cinema made a thriller called Snake Eyes. Not to be confused with Brian De Palma's Snake Eyes, which came later. Did he have but to my... reach out to you to like get your approval to use that title? No. No. <laughs> you know what's really interesting is I sent him the movie. Oh. Yeah, because I was a fan of his, and I just thought he might enjoy it because I felt that he, along with certain filmmakers like John Carpenter and Alfred Hitchcock and numerous others, had a strong influence on me even as a student. Hmm. So I sent it to him. I never heard from him. And then a few years later, he had a movie called Snake Eyes, and I went, wow, well, he took the title. <laughs> <laughs> Well, they, they would say theft is the is one of the highest forms of flattery. So right, right. So I I wouldn't go so far as to say he stole. I just right. don't know. But I I certainly had that title and sent him that movie long before he he made the the feature film. And that's the one that we talked about that you you made in high school. No, that was Teacher's Pet. Teacher's Pet. How many films have you actually made, Michael? Well, I I think. I've mentioned most of the narrative films that people can watch that are pure storytelling. Much of my career, which is not my favorite part of my career, but just making a living, has been making industrial videos for corporations and demonstration videos and things like that, which are all useful. I think any job that you take, that you're providing a service and doing the best job that you can for a client, is important work. But naturally, those of us who are storytellers, our preference, especially from a creative standpoint and freedom of expression, is to tell stories. Stories that come from something inside of you that you kind of feel compelled to share with an audience. And, and hopefully, you know, they, they enjoy it and experience something that's unique. I mean, that's one of the things that uh, I hope we can get into a little bit here with the differences, for example, between Up Against Amanda and my most recent feature film, which is Ed Ground, Paul's Annabelle Lee, very different structures on these. And Annabelle Lee is almost experimental in the way that I made that movie. Whereas Snake Eyes, okay, was a very straightforward thriller. And You've, I think you've seen that because it was used as part of an anthology called Terrorize. Yes. Right? Now, that was produced by Eric Parkinson and his wife, Vivian Schilling. They also used another USC student film that Steve Summers made. Now, Stephen Summers also, he graduated around the same time I did at USC. I knew Stephen Summers. He went on to make the Mummy movies for Universal. Got it. But anyway, they saw Snake Eyes. Snake Eyes got a good review in Variety, which I'm grateful for. I'm always grateful for good reviews. <laughs> <laughs> and they had a previous director, I do not know the name of the director, who was in pre-production on uh, Soul Taker, which was then known as The Kiss of Death. Not a, not a great title <laughs> for a movie, in my opinion. Yeah. But later, uh, I guess something didn't work out, and they had seen Snake Eyes and somehow purchased the rights to that from the school. We can get into the rights and how USC cinema works at another time, maybe. But they saw it and they said, we'd like to, to hire you to direct Soul Taker. So I was just brought in when they were already in pre-production on that movie. And essentially just shipped right out to Mobile, Alabama. And that was my first 35 millimeter film. And it was, you know, it was fun. But it, anytime that you're brought in just suddenly on something it yeah you kind of like you know you really have to get your bearings really fast and that was the case on that one but once again i just with what i had to work with and the time i had to work with i i did the best i could to make it something interesting it, again I, I have to say something too whenever i'm talking about anything i understand and i believe that it's up to the audience as to whether something works as storytellers we're doing the best job we can to tell a good story, to tell it in a way that it's the most effective visually and with audio and, and with the structure. But ultimately, it's up to the audience. It either works for them or it doesn't. And, and uh, I don't assume that anything that uh, I'm doing is, is going to work until 
an audience response to it. Well, I mean, that's that, the, of course, of course. Actually, the, I got to I, I have to jump back to something because you may or may not have an answer to this, but I am kind of curious. Yeah. Having done so much work in industrials, of course, none of us would have ever had a chance to see these. But in all that work, has there ever been one of those that you were like, you know, this actually got to the place where it, this is a work of art. No one else is going to see it. But I know that this was a special thing, a special project. I've had, you know, as a, I, I, I come from many different fields. And sometimes I find that when I'm not trying to make something really special and inspired and just serving a project that some I'll create something that is way better than what my intention was just because I'm just in service to whatever that project is if, like acting in a commercial. You're like, how can you do great acting in a commercial? Well, check out this one. You won't see it, but it was pretty special there. Is there anything, are there anything in among your many industrials where you're like, that was something special? I would say yes. And, you know, you got me thinking now because I've worked on so many different things over the years that there are different reasons why something can be special. So I'll give you a few examples. At the top of my list of something being special that way, I would say interviews with people that have gone through something very difficult still have an emotional impact for me. I, I did a... Uh, some work for the Cancer Society, American Cancer Society, and some of that was volunteer work on my part. And some of the stories that the people told, man, they're tearjerkers. Mm -hmm. They really get to you. And I remember that. I, I don't think you can put that in a category with, say, a visual montage that's beautiful. So, mm -hmm. you know, I've done demonstration videos with glass cutting and things like that. And I'll be proud of, wow, you know, the coverage of uh, how I just kind of allowed them to demonstrate their process. I'll be proud of something like that. But it's not on the same level as somebody's heartfelt story of a loved one that has gone through living and, in many cases, dying from cancer. So uh, I would say that's, that's special. And also, I've worked with celebrities. Mm -hmm. So when you, when you make videos with celebrities, if you make George Lucas laugh and he's sitting right next to you while he's watching something, I've had that experience. It's wonderful. Yeah, I bet. And I've done interviews for USC. This is a different situation. For USC, I made an orientation film, and I interviewed a lot of people that I admired greatly. And so I, there was a point at which for an introduction for that, I was directing Bob Zemeckis. And I was like, I can't believe this. Uh, this is the man who made, who framed Roger Rabbit and I'm directing him. That's really fun. Yeah. So, uh, and he's a great guy. One of the things that is special about the entertainment business is just the number of really interesting creative people you meet and uh, i never get tired of that that's really it's fun i would say i think that's that is the best part whether <laughs> whether you're successful or wherever you are like just being in the being in the industry to whatever degree we get to be in the industry we find ourselves sometimes working with people and we're like oh I'm actually this person's peer for this moment, and it's it's fantastic. Um, yeah. So uh, I didn't want to, we, we were we started this with the corrections. I just want to make sure: is there anything else in terms of our coverage of Up Against Amanda or your career that you feel like we should uh, we should let the audience in on? Uh, well, uh, uh, I, we corrected the terrorized thing, so you yep. know that I, I directed a segment and that that was originally at USC Film School and that they wound up acquiring that to, as part of an anthology. We talked about Karen and her career, and, you know, you can you can look up Karen Lawrence and find she, she was in a band called 1994. I think RCA was her label at that time, but this is going back 
into the 80s. And she was in another band called the LA Jets. I don't know. She's just done a lot of work and been with a lot of people. Her live album, I'll just mention this one last thing, was produced by Jack Douglas, who produced some of the Beatles stuff. So, so I mean, I get. So, just to be clear, if you didn't first, I don't know why you'd be listening to this if you hadn't listened to the original episode, but maybe you would. And Brian and I were sort of hipster jerks about the music. And clearly, she is uh, a bigger deal than we are and has done enough work in this business that she doesn't need to suffer fools like us lightly or at all. So, uh, that, you know, uh, consider uh, this. Uh, the closest we, I mean, we can get to an apology. I don't know. We put ourselves out there with work. Some people like it or don't, but clearly she is an accomplished uh, artist and also a member of your family. And uh, like, like, uh, like Francis Ford Coppola, you like to work with the people in your family and, you know, and it's, it's, uh, it's not cool when people, you know, when you hear people just who are trying to be nice about your movie and then slag off your, your uh beloved aunt so i uh, i'm sorry <laughs> well i on on your side i i have to say though for the movie we cut up a lot of her work the character within the movie is not my aunt so the way that we use the music we wanted to make it seem like she was up and coming but you know not really going to be at, at the top of the business so in a way you know what you what you had to say was fitting what we were trying to do with the movie so you know it's kind of there's a balance right, right. i'm just i'm just trying to protect my my aunt's <laughs> reputation because i love her and uh, and she's she's i think a, a wonderful musician and a great songwriter well it's inspiring me to go back and check out eyes of laura mars and uh and hear her song and uh yeah and just to be just more thoughtful in the future you know when talk yeah, it wasn't talking about any kind of art you know uh but at the same time as you said there there are some dynamics in the film that this plays on and we're gonna we're gonna get into that there is one other thing we just discovered this morning mm -hmm. going back and forth because we we discovered this film on Tubi. right now i feel like that's the main place the main portal to discover up against amanda mm -hmm. and you sent me an email this morning where you realized that the, the credits on to be uh, leave a lot to be desired. Yeah, they're they're incorrect, period. <laughs> they have the wrong director. They only have one person who's correct in the cast, and that's Chuck Williams. And everybody else is incorrect. Chuck Williams of Soul Taker fame. Pardon me? Chuck, Chuck Williams of Soul yeah. Taker fame. Yeah, yes. that's how I met Chuck. Uh, was on that movie. Well, the, let's let's hope the people at Two B tune into this. We're going to send it to them. They need to get that straight. My my co-host Brian, when I sent him that, he since he worked in a video store for like two and a half decades, mm -hmm. he has an incredible wealth of knowledge. And he looked at it and said, "Oh, those are the credits for Up from the Depths." Mm -hmm. uh, so I feel he like just it's... knew right. I I figured he went to IMDb or something, but that's possibly just remembered. Yeah. Um, I, so I, it sounds like it's just a clerical error at, at Tubi. I wonder, I if hope so. We should check up from the depths on Tubi and see if they have your credits. I would be very surprised. I don't know, because I think I saw it on Tubi not too long ago with the correct credits. So it's really odd. You know, it's almost like they changed within the last couple of days, which I find very mysterious. But, you know, the reason it matters is because things like the musicians, just yeah. to give an example, like my aunt or something, you know, she she provides the music for this movie. Well, she doesn't get her residuals through ASCAP or, you know, that sort of thing unless the credits are right and the right movie's being credited. So it's actually very important. Well, we are going to endeavor to we are endeavoring now to correct that. So that sounds um, good. Yeah. Let's get that right, Tubi. We love your service. We think it's great that you help us see fantastic movies that we wouldn't have seen otherwise but this this is an egregious mistake <laughs> it must be yeah corrected. they need to correct that so i'm sure they will <laughs> but the sooner the better yeah yeah so bringing it to up against amanda this film this is the film that that just uh as you heard from our our podcast it just kind of seduced us in the in i guess like amanda and 
I just like you to tell me what, what is what was your vision for this film when you entered into it? Well, you you reacted the way that I wanted you to react. That's for sure. Um, personally, I love being seduced when I'm watching a movie. I love it. And the more interesting the characters are, as long as the plot flows from the needs of the characters in a movie, I get pulled in. And that's what I like about watching a movie, and it's what I like about making a movie. And, you know, one of the things that I think every filmmaker should strive for is to have a unique way of looking at the world. Now, you can probably guess that I've been influenced to a very great degree by great filmmakers. And I could rattle off the people that I think are real visionaries that know how to use a camera and staging and blocking and lens choices and angles and all of that. But that's every detail. One of the reasons that, you know, I'm talking to you right now is that I think you on your podcast here and all of your friends who do this podcast, you appreciate detail. And what any filmmaker strives for if they want to get the most out of what they're doing for an audience is to use everything, every tool available to them. And those tools are used to pull people in away from their everyday world that they live in to experience the world of the story you're telling. So right away, you want to use a style that sets your movie apart. And in my opinion, this is easier to do with the thriller genre because the heightened nature of thrillers when you're dealing with people's fears and anxieties allows you, actually, as a, a stylist in the world of images to kind of go for the extremes, right? So what I'm doing with the movie, even from the very beginning, and I think it's something that you guys mentioned, I'm giving you the backstory right up front, and I'm doing it with angles that are kind of disorienting, and I'm using water for the same reason. You know, one of the reasons that water is very effective in a movie like this is because there's, it's fluid. There's something that's unstable about water and yet beautiful at the same, same time. There's so, I mean, the water in your, fit like, it's everywhere. It is one, yeah. of, it's one of the wettest films I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's not by accident. Yeah. I think it's beautiful, though. See, oh, I, I really... I agree. And you'll kind of see the same thing with reflections and glass, used for the same reason. Uh, it's, it's a little disorienting, but it's also really beautiful to look at the images in various ways of being distorted. So that distortion kind of leads to what the themes in the movie are, though. Mm -hmm. You have a character that's had a, a very difficult childhood, to say the least. Mm -hmm. And you guys describe some of what the plot of the movie... I don't want to tell people too much about what the movie's about, but she's, she's been abused. Mm -hmm. And I think every individual can relate to abuse. We've all been abused by somebody at some point, mm -hmm. but there are degrees, right? People have been bullied in various ways throughout at school, at work, even in familial settings. So the thing is that once you set up a person, you understand that they've experienced this, you know, you're going to be sympathetic to them. And there is something unique about this movie. I'm very proud of, of a lot of the, the characterizations in this movie, particularly Amanda, because I think there's gray area that is unsettling, but at the same time really interesting when you're thinking about why 
people do what they do. And so one of the things that I make an effort to do as a director is I take the point of view of every single character in a movie. Because otherwise, how can I believe that that person exists, right? So I'll take the position of you know, Karen Grosso's character, Laurie Kerrigan, in this movie. That's, this is an ambitious person. Well, ambition is good. She has talent, and she's, she's trying to achieve something. So I'll take her position, and maybe there are extremes, but, you know, all of us make mistakes. There are times when we go a little bit too far. Mm-hmm. And so that's something that that character does. But I can relate to her. I can relate to every single person in the movie. And the that's doctor? an important Wait thing Wait a second. The do- how about the doctor who, who sets her up and does his sex slave? Not to yeah, well, he's a total extreme. He's hard. He's and a, he he's pays a, a very one. heavy price. Yes, he does. I but, guess you do. I guess we. Th- I guess that's where we relate to him. Is it's like this is the he. He's the one who receives the worst possible punishment. <laughs> he really does. You know, it's and like if he's a cautionary tale. Don't underestimate people. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, even there, you know, the the problem is, you have people that take their positions of power. And the worst kind of abuse comes from people who take power that's there for a good reason. Mm -hmm. And they're meant to be using that to help people. And the very, very worst kind of abuse, it doesn't matter if it's a priest, a doctor, a politician. Or a director. They have that power to help people. And I, you know, one of the, that's one of the things that I think is very satisfying in this movie, because we haven't talked about levels of power and responsibility, but the corruption, which is basically incarnate in the character of the doctor, is really... <laughs> She's her response is revolutionary. Mm-hmm. I mean, it is. There is no sympathy for that character, really. <laughs> yeah. Now is and isn't there? I, I forget what it is. Is she, is she later on wearing a shirt called "Riot" that says "Riot Girl" or "Girl Power"? Girl Power. Girl Power. Yeah. I yeah. There's some when you say that there's a revolution in it. I can. There's some way that that image connects, even just the way she's just gleefully. I think maybe that's why we let, why it, I as an audience member find myself liking and sympathizing with her. She enjoys well, herself. Like, she does. <laughs> and there's something yeah. in that performance because her life is so much pain because of where, where the film starts just to see her enjoying herself, even if she's killing a dog is is you're kind of ha- you're kind of with her. You want her to have a good experience. Maybe not this good experience, but a good experience. Um anyway, sorry. I we had a whole show where I I talked about the movie. Let's I want to hear more from you. Well, one thing that I think is important to recognize is that Every single person who watches this movie or any movie brings their own life experience to the movie. And what I relate to is anybody who's an underdog. And when I say underdog, I mean that at at every variation of what an underdog can be, which is if you look at kind of my background uh, on almost everything that interests me as a storyteller, I'm interested in freedom. I'm interested in people who are trapped, who are trying to figure out how to get out of the trap. Mm. Because I think, you know, I have a kind of a philosophy that every person in one way or another has to use their brains to kind of move forward in life. Because if you accept the trap that just naturally surrounds you, if you're not thinking, you're not going to have a very pleasant life, right? 
So I look at her character and she's got so much against her. There's no question that she's a villain. And yet the reason that she's a villain stems from a very abusive background. And what I hope is people have a nurturing youth. You know, I mean, in their youth, they, we hope that they have parents that uh, have positive reinforcement and teachers the same way, and that give them enough room to understand that they're an individual and that life can be a very positive thing. I think life is a very positive thing. I'm grateful to be alive. Hopefully most people are. But you need to have the freedom to express yourself and to see the world and experience it the way you do as an individual and not have people telling you what to do all day long and telling you what to think all day long. And I think anyway that, that what's going on here is I'm taking a genre, right? And I'm using a lot of very familiar plot devices, but at the same time, I always attempt to have some humor there. And in the case of this movie, I think the humor is very upfront. Mm -hmm. you know, there are a lot of lines in this movie that have more than one meaning. Yeah. And there are a lot of things that I plant that get paid off later. And that's one of the things that I still enjoy is that, it, you know, if people are paying attention, which I hope they are, you know, I love it when audiences are using their brains and they're thinking. So nowadays, you know, you don't necessarily just see a movie at a theater and you go home and go, oh, that was fun. You know, you can really analyze movies now mm -hmm. because you buy the DVD and you can play it and you can. So, you know, there'd be a scene where let's say that she asks the uh, the character of Richard to come over and take care of a spider that she's afraid of. Well, his his line is that that's a good spider. Good spiders, they uh, they take care of pests, right? Mm -hmm. Well, she's that's kind of a symbol of Amanda, <laughs> right? Because she's like, hmm. If you look at her face at the end of that scene, she's like, oh well, maybe I'm kind of a good spider, and it pays off later because she sees Buzz. Notice I call him Buzz. Mm -hmm. That's not that's not an accident. Oh yeah. He because to her she he's a pest. Right. He gets in the way like a buzzing little fly, and so the spider, her job is to get rid of the pests. These are little things that you know are planted as symbols throughout the movie, but that's kind of like the satirical elements. And one of the things that's important to me, I love satire. I'm a huge fan of Mark Twain, probably my favorite writer. Mm -hmm. I love satire, but satire is meant for you to learn something. It's not cynicism. I don't believe in cynicism. I always think that you, could, you should take what's negative and do your best to turn it into something positive in life. I'm a big believer in that. So I hope, I don't know if it's always successful. I mean, it's, the audience will say yay or nay, but I love satire because it's meant for you to learn something to correct the problem. I'm not, I, I do not like sarcasm. I do not like cynicism. Yeah. It, you know, one of the things that you do whenever you're telling a story, you're trying to maintain a balance. And that has to do with things like even uh, character versus plot, right? This is an age-old question. What's more important, the plot or the character? That goes back to Aristotle. You want it to feel organic. So hopefully all of the actions that take place, you know, is driven by the motivations of the characters and what their, their goals are. Have you ever heard uh, Warren Beatty talk about this? He talks about how people say that character is plot. And if that's the case then if then if casting is a huge part of character then casting is plot well that's taking it a step you know farther than i've heard it taken before but i think that makes sense i mean particularly casting. i think if you're like warren Beatty and you're casting all movie stars in your movie then everyone you're casting comes with a whole 
catalog of references be- behind them that we, you know, whatever. Samuel Jackson walks into the movie and he brings his whole filmography with him. And so in that case, casting is, char- is character. Anyway, uh, I don't want to get into that, although this maybe is the perfect time to talk about it because you landed on a, you know, one of those happy miracles of casting that once it's there, it's indelible. I can't imagine this movie without Justine Priestley in it. The performance is, I kind of, I'm kind of getting chills. Just it's, it's, she's, she has so much charisma and like you're talking about, she plays the satire. She plays everything. She gives you so much in this movie. Can you just talk about when, like the process of finding your Amanda and finding Justine? Sure. She really is great in the movie. And I I can't say enough good things about her. Now, I think everybody's good in the movie. I think David DeWitt also did an excellent job. I, everybody did a great job. Mm-hmm. Justine, she she has some unique gifts that I think I should kind of share with the world here that I've shared with her. But, you know, I'll, I'll, give, I'll use a couple of examples so that you can go back and kind of look at a couple of scenes that I think are kind of special. One of them is the picnic scene. That scene requires some really dramatic shifts emotionally from her. And, you know, she's infatuated at the beginning and she's so happy to be alone with Richard. It's a perfect idyllic setting, bucolic, sunny day and everything like that. And then you know, he's basically very, very dry with her and like, you know what, this is not going to work. And from there, it's required by the storyline that she becomes extremely angry. You see that flashpoint of Amanda, of somebody who's capable of killing people, you know, just this rage. Mm-hmm. And then coming down from that and just going, look, can we just be friends? You know, I'm just trying to, like, she doesn't have any friend in life and never has. And the way that she goes through those beats of emotion is phenomenal. It's just, it's a beautiful thing to see. And no matter how many times I see it, it still affects me Mm. because she played it so well. So hitting those beats like that, you have to wonder how many actors could handle that. The shifts is what I'm talking about. Being able to go that fast from joy to rage to sorrow to a kind of helpless pleading. It's, uh, it's really a beautiful thing to see. And in terms of her just basic skills, I could come up with something on the day. And sometimes I do, you know, because I'm, I'm a flexible person when it comes to lines and things like that. If I see an opportunity to go, you know what, we can make this a little bit better. If you remember the scene in the kitchen where she's making the drinks. Oh, this is God, that's a great end. scene. She, she's <laughs> fan- that Her knife work in that is so fantastic. I love it. Yeah. Go on. Yes. Yes. And by the way, because uh, I think this is a previous question from your podcast. Yes, I storyboard everything. You can probably tell. <laughs> It's, yeah, well, yeah, we'll get into that, but yeah. She was able to take, uh, I I think that day, you know, I may be slightly off, but I'm pretty sure that I came up with an additional, like, two paragraphs of lines for her that day, and she memorized them in 45 minutes. And that's just how skillful she is as an actor. Now, you, it is true that I... I'm very selective about what parts of performances I use, and the editing is all part of the style of how I do things. But you can't take away from the fact that an actor like Justine, she did do that entire scene in one take without missing a line. You don't know that, but I know that. Mm -hmm. And that's impressive, and and it just makes the job of the people behind the camera so much easier when you have characters with... I mean, actors with that ability. Yeah, yeah. 
And she does. Now, also, you may have noticed, I think she even mentioned this on uh, Instagram, we had an absolutely wonderful person on makeup and hair on Up Against Amanda named Michelle Torres. I can't give her enough credit. If you look at all the different hairstyles yeah. that she came up with for Amanda, they're fantastic, and they're it's a big part. Uh, you know, I think Justine would be the first to tell you, you know, when you have first-rate people doing things like hair and makeup, that, is, that helps the character characterization for the actor so much and so i just want to give her credit for that yeah no that's one of those invisible things uh, in a in a film or in a characterization that unless you're aware of it and even like if you you know you could think that you're aware of film but you did i i hadn't connected those dots but now when i think about it it's like oh yeah she does have so many different looks yeah in the film from like when she busts into the house, that look, and when she's the avenging angel against the doctor, that look, and when she's the seductress, and when she's the girl next door, and just, yeah, yeah, it does. Bravo to Michelle Torres. Good job. Good job, Michelle. <laughs> it really was. And it, it, every department on a movie makes a difference. So, you know, people <laughs> come up to me, is this right? Is this right? And, and uh, you know, as a director, you go, yes, that's the right look for this, this, and this but they still have the creativity that they bring to you. You see what I mean? And so yeah. when you have an expert, it just makes your job so much easier. And that goes for costumes, lighting, and so many different aspects of the film. Because what, mostly what you're concentrating on is you're trying to get the characterizations with the actors right, the blocking, and nailing the visuals. You know, so whenever people come to you and say, how is, is this hairstyle going to work? And you go, that's beautiful. That's perfect. Then that takes care of that. You see, right. it's just really nice. Yeah. Well, that, that brings us to the crew now. And just to this production, mm -hmm. how big is your crew? What's the budget you're working with? What you like there, there's this production <laughs> in terms of the coverage and all the stuff you get is as it's so impressive yeah well it's also you're a one man show as a writer director editor so just how what's the what's the team that you work with well and it it depends on the movie is the first thing i'll say because on soul taker um we had a much bigger crew i would say than the the skeleton crew we had for up against amanda i guess the best way to talk about that is we were really on this thing we were working with favors i mean people were just people who wanted to work on the movie just said okay let's well, i'll do it for whatever you got and i'm a member of the writers guild of america right mm -hmm. so you could probably guess in order to make this movie i had to have a special waiver deal with my own union and i, I don't want to get into all that because there's like mm. it's just this movie was made with favors, and it was a labor of love, and it was something where I said, look, I'm interested in kind of, I was sort of inspired by Hitchcock's Psycho in this sense. You know, at the time that he, before he made that movie, he was already working on a TV show in black and white, right? He was doing his Alfred Hitchcock Presents. And I guess at some point he said, you know, I could just make a movie on my own and own the negative, and I'm just going to. I think with a minimum of, of sets and, you know, make something that's really astonishing, just outrageous, you know, for the audience. And that's what he did. And I was kind of thinking, you know, one of the things that works really well in thrillers is you take the familiar and you turn it upside down, right? So I thought, well, why? let's take a, a neighborhood. Spielberg did this too with Poltergeist. I mean, Toby Hooper was the mm -hmm. director, I guess. Of record. But uh, <laughs> of record, yeah. right. That's a whole nother story. <laughs> but I thought, you know, th let's take the familiar, something that's not, I don't have to build this on a sound stage, And uh, let's take what's just in a regular, normal neighborhood somewhere in California, Southern California, and just introduce this character into the neighborhood that just throws everything out of whack and creates all of these crazy situations. 
And that was kind of the challenge. So once you, you take the idea of the familiar and then you, you kind of add all of these other elements, it, it really becomes unsettling, you know? <laughs> and uh, there's part of, one of the things that's interesting to me too, that I don't think people realize maybe who watch thrillers is most of the filmmakers who make thrillers, they have a sense of humor. There's, there's part of this that we really look at as a roller coaster too. So you want the thematic materials to have truth. You want that so that people emotionally feel what's going on. They believe in the characters and they believe in what's happening. You know, temptation is a real thing. And you want to kind of allow the audience to vicariously be bad, mm -hmm. but then the characters they're watching pay for it. So then you get to walk out from having had this, you know, you're like, I vicariously was the bad person here and I had an affair, but I didn't really do this. Mm -hmm. That's one of the things, that's catharsis. That's what good storytelling does. That, that is part of the whole cautionary tale idea. But you want to make it enough twists and turns that people don't know what's going to happen next. And you guys, I think at one point you were using the word certain genres have known what you guys, I think you call tropes. I don't, I'm not that familiar with that word, maybe because I'm a little older, I don't know, but it's cliches to me. Mm -hmm. We want to avoid the cliches. We got to have just enough in there that people feel like they know where something's going so that you can turn it around and make it something else. Right. Yeah. I'm on a roller. I know that I'm on a roller coaster. Right. So when you fake me out, I'm already prepared. Like this is a fun ride. I'm right. prepared to be scared in a fun way as opposed to genuinely terrified. Maybe that's the difference between a thriller and a horror. Uh, in some ways, maybe. But I, I think also with a thriller, you're dealing more with suspense and less with shock, less with gross out. Mm -hmm. And here's another thing that I think I should bring up. And uh, I, I'm probably going over my... I, I wanted, as you remember, I... Uh, when we talked about this earlier, I was saying, I don't think that our interview should be as long as the movie. <laughs> well, I, I always budget enough time because I, I these conversations tend to flow and I, I find them tremendously interesting. Well, uh, what I was about to talk about is uh, Stephen King. Mm -hmm. I, I, had, I was heavily influenced by Stephen King when I was very young. Okay, When I was a teenager in high school, I just read everything I could lay my hands on that was written by Stephen King. Me too. And the reason is because he, he, I always found that his literary style was so accessible, so conversational, mm -hmm. and yet kind of like I was talking about how, you know, the, you start out with something familiar and then you turn it upside down in, in storytelling settings. He's an expert at that. And he wrote a book called Dance Macabre, mm -hmm. which... Love it. I recommend it to anybody who's interested in how thrillers and horror films work because he does a very good job of describing the difference between suspense and shock and gore. And, you know, he specializes in horror, but I think even Stephen King recognizes that suspense as an experience for the audience is really the highest form of entertainment. A shock lasts for bang, mm -hmm. and it's over, right? And it gets your adrenaline going, you're horrified for a split second, but suspense is delicious because yeah. you're, you're on the edge of your seat. And so, you know, my preference, it would, you're going to use different things. It's all part of the toolbox of telling a story, but suspense is what you know, the, the, I think the great filmmakers are always reaching for. Yeah, yeah. And it works in a different way because you, the audience knows more than the characters. That's why they're in suspense, because they're waiting for the characters to find out things they already know, and they're in a superior position that way. Whereas with shock, that you know, they're startled. And it's still effective, but they like being in a superior position. 
So it's interesting. It's actually, in my view, it's the easiest way to satisfy an audience is to put them in a position of superiority with regard to the information. They know more than the characters know. Now, you will, you know, you just saw, you said, uh, you know, like the last movie I made was Annabelle Lee. Annabelle Lee has a lot of mystery in it, and it's riskier. It's more like a, an experimental structure for somebody like me because the audience, they learn things as the film progresses and they don't have the same level of suspense because mystery works in a completely different way. It's like a puzzle that's being right. put together. So, whole different style. I don't like to repeat myself, so, <laughs> you know, I really went for something very different with that movie. And I think that's interesting, too, is, is the differences between structures in how you tell a story. Yeah, and in both films, I feel like one of the like a, a an element which is a star of the film is the editing which also goes to something that I I think we talked about on the episode and which really just struck me was the amount of coverage that you got and actually thinking about now the making of industrials I feel like oh well that's probably great training for you know demonstrating how things work and there's a lot of that in Up Against Amanda. I think maybe in in Annabelle Lee, there, it's a little bit more poetic. And I actually love. I mean, the editing in that film, the stuff you're doing with like the fa like the face of the woman showing up in the Coca Cola, and just like there's, it's really wonderful. I just it, it it it's the kind of thing that if it's done poorly, it takes you out of the film, and if it's done well, it just sucks you into the film. And I'd just like you to talk to uh, a little bit to how how you go about crafting your productions from the standpoint of being the editor who is giving notes to the director and the, to giving notes to yourself as the director as you put all this together. And maybe let's talk about Up Against Amanda particularly because I feel like that's the one that our audience might be more familiar with. Okay. Well, one of the things that like I said, I strive for with each film is to make it something unique and different. It is true that if you have been an editor, and in my case, of course, these films I, I did direct and edit, so while I'm directing it, I'm thinking of the pieces that I'm going to put together. In particular, it's helpful with actors who don't have a tremendous amount of experience. So... I, I think I can use the example of Justine in that kitchen scene as a perfect example of somebody who does not need to be edited in that scene because she managed it in one take. Mm -hmm. She's a very good actor. It takes, takes a lot of skill to do that. Not every actor can do that, especially if they're given lines the same day. Okay? Right. As it turns out, that scene is better with the editing and the cutaways to show the reactions of Richard, the character who she's talking to, and to show what she's, all the activities, she's using the knife and she's cutting up, you know, slicing the uh, oranges and, you know, putting the drinks together. And the editing is part of what makes that Something where the audience feels a great deal of anxiety. So that's very important. But in some cases, and this is just kind of like out there for people who are into filmmaking, you want to be able to have options. And in case you have an actor that pauses or forgets a line and has to start over again, it's just a good idea to work into your coverage a way to get out of that. Otherwise, you could be there all day. Right. See? And so that's something I learned to do a long time ago. I do that, but ideally, 
every time you make a cut, it's in service to the story. It's because the audience needs to see the next shot as the best possible way to move forward, to tell them something that they need to know, to see a reaction of somebody else to what's being said. But to be honest, it doesn't always work that way. Sometimes you just need a cutaway because not every actor is a great actor. Well, in terms of like going back to when you're, you're saying you're doing with the skeleton crew of people all doing favors. And I feel like anyone who's worked on any film, but particularly a film where there's budgetary constrict uh, restrictions, there's a lot of saying, oh, well, do we really need that? Do we really need that shot? Do we really need that shot? And one of the things that blew me away from in this film is how many times your crew or you, you prioritize the shots that you'd be like, do we really need that? Like my, my favorite, and I think I say it in the episode is there's a scene when she's taking care of the doctor and she goes and she goes away to, to, to get rid of his car. And you have a shot where she goes into a shop where there's an act. There's he's this guy's working in the shop. She shows up, she tosses him the key and she leaves. Now that's a whole other setup. That's like, I don't know how many hours it took to set that <laughs> up and do that shot. You to prior, that's a shot that someone else would be like, yeah, do we really need that? We're, 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 we're running low on time. But throughout the film, it seems like you're prioritizing that stuff. And that's where when you're talking about Hitchcock or De Palma, I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, I totally get it. But those guys are Hitchcock and De Palma. And even when they're working low budget, they're not working with this low a budget. So how like could you talk to this, how you go about getting your skeleton crew that's doing favors on board with no, 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 we need that insert. Let's prioritize that. Uh, that's a good question. And I will say that even I prioritize things, what's the most important. So that kind of material, I generally leave for pickups. So we have principal photography, right? And on this, it's like pretty short. Four weeks of principal photography, and we cram as much in as we can. And I'm, I'm pretty demanding. But, you know, I think people want to work with people who are demanding because they know that means that the end result is going to be better. I, I like to work with people who are passionate. If you're not working with people that are passionate, then you're probably, you don't belong doing this. I just remember even in film school, now I was a lot younger then. When you're younger, I mean, you can stay up for 24 hours yeah. if necessary. Yeah. And you get a little bit older and you're like, I need some sleep. Yep. And there's a, I should bring up another really important concept, which is called the point of diminishing returns. Have you ever heard that phrase before? Absolutely, yeah. So this really applies to filmmaking. There, there's so many times when you know you're working and you're trying to squeeze in something that maybe you just don't, you don't have everything quite right. You're like, ah, I get 15 more minutes before we wrap. I think I can get this and this and get this line a little bit better. It reaches a point, really, where you have to say, I understand that everybody's too tired to move on. You just, it, and the, I think the crew in general you know, will give you the signals. You got to listen to the signals. I'm not saying everybody's perfect. There are times when we all go a little bit too far, uh, but you know, the longer you do this kind of work, the crew will give you, you know, like, we got to we got to wrap yeah <laughs> and you just have to let it go because this this concept of the law of diminishing returns is you cannot keep squeezing people it won't get better it won't get better because now now you're just upsetting people mm -hmm. and um you know i mean that happens it happens and i i try really every single day that i'm i'm working on a movie to go, okay, well, have we reached that point of diminishing returns? All you have to do, and I, I let people know that concept. If we've reached that, I'm like, all right, let's just go. You know, we'll, we'll figure this out somehow. And, you know, we do what we have to do. But uh, it, it's an important concept because, you know, it's even true of somebody who's really passionate about their what they're doing and thinking they're going to do better work. Well, no, if you're, if you're fried, you're fried. Yeah. It's time to go home. Yeah. So when you say, so you did four weeks of initial, of principal, photo, uh, principal photography, and it's funny, 
that's that's short by the standards of 1999. That's actually not that short by modern standards. But how much did you? How much time did you budget for pickups? I think we probably had about five days of pickups. I'm pretty sure. Well, I mean, talk about a skeleton crew. We had hardly anybody in Vegas. I mean, that was all crazy, just mm -hmm. grabbing what we could grab. And that's the kind of uh, thing that we also did that when um, you see her in the convenience store when uh, toward the end of the movie mm -hmm. when uh, she's planning to go out on a, a little getaway with Richard because that's the point at which he's using a little bit of you know, false persuasion mm -hmm. with Amanda because he realizes that he's in big trouble. Those kind of shots, you grab them. You get a skeleton crew, just a few people. You go out there, you make a deal with the location, and you shoot it quick. So you actually, like with the with the stuff in Vegas, did you actually talk to the casino, or did you were you just grabbing shots? Well, we had... <laughs> You were just grabbing it, it shots. Was kind of, <laughs> it, it was a kind of a mix of things. Yeah. Some, yeah. Was, some was prepared ahead of time, and some was just grab as you can. Yeah, yeah. You know, when you were talking about Hitchcock and about suspense, I couldn't help but kind of connect your hot tub to the shower. <laughs> that uh, the hot tub is plays a lot a major role on so does it does so much i don't want to say heavy lifting but lifting in this film because of the water motifs because of Amanda, how that connects to amanda's origin story but that just then how much it figures into the whole plot of the film and one of the things and i i don't know if you intended this to be part of the suspense but one of the things that I found incredibly stressful was just the idea of eating in a hot tub. That just seems like I it took me a long time to just get over that how to eat a taco because it just seemed like I don't want something that's going to fall apart on me. And the idea of eating in a hot tub, it just seems like now there's crumbs in the hot tub. I don't like this. It was yeah, Were you funny. aware of that? I mean, are were you like because I think there is something like you're talking about the nor like taking the normal and flipping it flipping it on its head yeah yeah were you aware well, of that i was uh th there is a um you know when when they're eating it's true it's off of a plate that they're holding right right S so that is awkward and i found that interesting i thought that would that would play well and i think it does but you know when she lays the food down and that's also a line where she says, oh, I can I can cook just about anything, mm. right? Do, if you remember, that's that's got a double meaning. Right. Because earlier she says, okay. That's one of the things that, again, I certainly strive for is giving the audience these little nods where they know that a character has got subtext. They say one thing, but the audience realizes it also can mean something else, which is also true of the title up against Amanda means a lot of things. Bringing it back to the tub, that's what like he's like when we go from the stress, the stressful eating in the tub to the, you know, the betrayal or the seduction or however you want to however you want to frame it, that Richard is literally up against Amanda mm -hmm. in that moment. And it really is, uh, Justin, I don't think you're, you, you'll be unaware of this, but Justin, I, Justin and I recorded our talk about the, your film twice because the first time, I think we recorded it later in the evening and there was a little bit of drinking involved. It got a little bit sloppy and, and so we decided to redo it. But, uh, but in that, we both were talking about how that scene when she finally seduces Richard that it is a genuinely erotic scene without like being pornographic or showing anything and a lot of times in 
uh, in movies where you have to have that scene. It's like it's obligatory. And if the act, the actors are attractive, it's attractive, but it doesn't have a like erotic tug to it. And I don't know mm-hmm. if that's performance or if that's editing or if that's something that you're aware of, that it was just a dynamic on the, you know, in, on the set that day that that the two actors brought to it. But it is a very deeply like erotic scene. Was that in the moment or is that the editing, I guess, is the main question. Well, that scene was the audition sides for the actors. So I knew that was a pivotal scene from the very beginning, and I had every intention of making sure that that scene was fantastic. So, But it's a very high compliment that it worked for you. Yeah, I mean, eroticism is something that is so hard to do right Mm -hmm. so that people emotionally are really pulled in and feel that tension. And I just think it's a beautiful thing when it happens. The way that that is shot is very stationary. And it's tense. You you can feel it. The actors are the ones that deserve the most credit. And in that case, my job is to set them up with the right lines, which I think we did. I think the lines are very nice in that scene. And then let them go. You know, part of directing is knowing when to stop with all of the tricks and let the camera roll and let the atmosphere and the actors do their thing. And uh, I, I think that when I do start using the angles, it's when you're already sucked in. Mm-hmm. So I'm glad that worked for you. It's a pivotal scene. You know, if that scene doesn't work, you're, you're gone. Oh, yeah. No, Justin and I were both talking about it. I was like, I don't know if I, I couldn't say, like, the whole time you're like, don't do it, don't do it. And then he's there and like, I don't think I could say no. <laughs> that's what, yes, that's that's when it's safest to, to uh, be the person who's experiencing it vicariously. So you can go, I hope I don't get into that situation. Because, yeah. Yeah. That spider, uh, then, that spider owns that fly. That's for there sure. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah that, well, then that's what movies, you know, that's part of the job of a movie is to kind of take you that place in a story so that when the lights come up, you can go, whoo, whoo, that was something. Yeah. <laughs> you know? and, and then you take off. Um, uh, so, uh, yes. Uh, oh, go on. No, I was just going to say that uh, Justine is really, she knows how to use those lines. Man. Yeah. Yeah, yes, she's uh, yeah, she's great. And in that scene, again, it's like it's a, uh, it's just it all comes together. It comes together perfectly. Um, there's an so the the water motif is. I don't, I don't want to say it's obvious because I think the one of the things that's I I wasn't it wasn't obvious to me the first time I watched it. It was only on multiple watchings that I was like, oh, I see what he's doing here. But one of the other ones that I at the same uh, on multiple viewings notice was this starburst effect that you're getting with the lights, like with the, with the scene of the car and the traffic or just when like pretty much throughout whenever the, there's a light showing at the camera, we don't see it as a light. We see it as like this sort of X or a right. Uh, and yeah. it's so much that it, you know, especially as an editor, you either you, that must be intentional. I'd love for you to talk about what, you know, where that's coming from. Well, I will. And uh, it sort of is related to the water motif, too. But I, I think I'll, uh, you know, I'll get into that in a second here. I just want to mention, too, that she's she has glittering stars on her skin during the bar scene. Uh, you oh, may not have noticed. Yes, that. yes. But I now didn't... you. Oh, OK. Yeah. The reason that that I think works very well and that I thought that filter effect was particularly appropriate for this movie is because it's part of what I would describe as a dreamlike quality that I think is very important for this kind of movie. I want you to feel like you're half awake because this is the way, to me, when 
temptation leads to bad decision making, it's because we're not hyper aware of what's going on. We're not thinking into the future. We're not thinking about cause and effect, how a poor decision can really lead in the wrong direction. So one of the things that happens when you squint your eyes is lights start to look like they, they have these little glares of stars almost when you squint a little bit. And I sort of wanted to give people the impression, but in a very subtle way, that they're not fully awake now. They're in this surreal world where they're being seduced willingly. And that's related also to the water imagery because it's surreal. I'm shooting through glass and things are fluid. And this is a way, in my opinion, on a visual level of creating a very surreal environment. And if it works for you, then then it works. Yeah, yeah. And we, we, we actually talked, I think we talked about it in the episode, uh, that shot, the car shot on the freeway where Richard's trying to get to the gig and it, I don't know if it's the first time we get that effect, but it's sort of overwhelming. And that shot is pretty beautiful. Again, when you're the first time you're watching it, you're trying to, you know, whenever we watch a, a piece of art or yeah, I guess a piece of art, a piece of art and commerce, when we are watching it, there's a part of us the first time our brain is like, well, do I like this? Is this good? Am I, you know, what is, is this a good thing? And for me, something about that shot was one of the things where I was like, wow, this film is just doing, is giving extra energy to things where a lesser film decides that ah, it's not worth it. <laughs> Let's just get from one place to another. Can you talk, how did you get that shot? Were you just, follow, did you just have, were you just in a car and he was following and you just, that was just a magical moment? Uh, or yeah, talk to getting that that uh, footage. Oh, well, that was not easy. We uh, picked that specific day, I think, because, you know, traffic was bad that day, and I think it was a little rainy, if I'm not mistaken, sprinkling or something. And, it, you know, it's something that requires several passes, right? One car is following another car. You have the camera in one car. You have the other one. And you grab it as you can, and you're you're talking to people. In that case, I think we might have had walkie-talkies. Mm -hmm. And you just say, oh, we're rolling. And then uh, you have like a, a, a radio mic that the actor has in the car with him. But you just, you know, it takes several passes. You get off an off-ramp, you go around, you do it again. <laughs> it's not, it's, there's nothing magical about it. And then you... I'm sitting there as the director right next to the camera going, okay, that's it. That's the one. And then you can move on. But it's that's real traffic. Yeah. We don't block the freeway. Yeah, that's what I mean. Like it's uh I guess right, it's I guess what's special is prioritizing getting it. And I think mm -hmm. that's the thing for me throughout that it just gets me over and over again. Beyond the performances, beyond the editing is just the prioritization of certain details that make this so like whatever your budget was, the intention intention isn't low budget. You're, right. you're getting the absolute like you're, it seems like you're getting more than the most out of your resources because I don't know how a production like this prioritizes some of these shots that make the movie so special. But again, that's you as the director, editor, doing a labor of love and getting your crew on board and saying, no, we, we need this shot, and they're with you. I'm glad you feel that way. I, it reminds me of uh, a professor of mine, Mort Zarkoff, at USC Cinema. And I remember being in his office one day and we were talking about things, and uh, it just so happened that we had a great rapport. And at one point, I think I was getting up to leave after discussing some issues with shooting a film I was working on, probably Snake Eyes. And uh, by the way, he was the first person to introduce the concept of the 
point of diminishing returns with me. Mm -hmm. It's like, don't press your crew mm -hmm. too hard, even at the student level. But um, there's one thing that he said when I got up and he said, you know, what I like about you, Mike, is you care. And I said, I, I was totally confused by what he meant. And I, I was like, I, I what? You care. And I, again, I looked at him and I said, I, of course I care. I mean, I'm, the reason I'm at this film school is because I love making movies. And he's like, no, you don't understand. There's a lot of students that are here. They, they want to get into the business, make a buck. You know, they're in because they, uh, they're they related to somebody or whatever. They don't really care. They, as soon as they get the shot, you know, they're like what some people call the company type person. They, mm -hmm. they put in their hours and out they go. And he said, I, I just love that you care about what you're doing. You're always trying to make it the best you can make it. And I was like, why would anybody do anything else? <laughs> if you have that in your in you, then that's, again, that is... I'm sure that now that you've been in the business a long time and you've collaborated with a lot of people, you understand that because you've worked with people who are the kind of people who care and are just like, why would I not ha give you the best? You got me for 10 hours. I'm going to give you the best of everything for those 10 hours as opposed to, and if you need an 11th hour, then yeah, because I want it to be right. My name's going to be on it. I'm going to watch it. And some people just don't have that. Uh, and so, do you, and I, I imagine that you have, over the years, found the people in the industry who, who you work with who bring that same level of attention to what they do. Well, that you know, that's that's where the joy is. I, even talking to you right now, why am I talking to you? Because I can tell that you and uh, you know everybody basically on your podcast, uh, Brian and Justin Freed, Brian Connolly. I mean, I heard them talking. You guys <laughs> care. You know, it's a it's a great, it's a wonderful thing. Uh, I I mean, you can be Francis Ford Coppola talking about this when you run into people that really love film, they really love details, and they just get into it. You know, it's it's great because the 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 passion that you bring to something is what makes life worthwhile. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, it's the same thing with people. You know, whenever I run into anybody that's passionate about something, it's it's great because, you know, that's the that's the best life is, is when you care about it's love. Everything is based on love. You know, all everything good is based on love of either telling a good story and, you know, kind of this brings me to something. You know, people talk about movies as escapism. And I don't look at movies as escapism, even if a movie is not realistic. I don't I don't think of it that way. I think of it as either cathartic, mm -hmm. so you learn something, hopefully. You experience something visual that's beautiful, I hope, because the people are trying to do that. Um, th there might be less and less of that, by the way. When I was at USC, I, we were sort of taught the golden age of filmmaking. Mm -hmm. So you wanted the experience to be a little bit better than real life in terms of the visuals. Yeah, I bet. Uh no, I'm going back to the origin of Up Against Amanda. When you wrote it, did you did you go around? Did you pitch it to to studios? What was at some point you you decided you're I'm going to do this all on my own. But before that, did you try and get other production entities on board? And what was that process like? That is a good question because I don't think I did that with this project. You just knew that it was yours. Yeah, you know, it's kind of like, like I said, I, I think I sort of looked at Hitchcock's cycle and said, why don't I just do this whole thing, like, with with what's available and nice. just get it over with, do it. Because, well, I'll tell you, I wrote a screenplay based on a short story by a man named Stanley Cohen called The Battered Mailbox. It was a short story, and I turned, I got the rights to it, I obtained the rights, made a deal with him, and I wrote a screenplay. I think it's a wonderful screenplay. It was optioned by Touchstone, and Randall Kleiser, who's been a good friend for years, he directed the movie Grease, and Honey, I Blew Up the Kid for Disney, and I don't know, a lot of stuff. I met him because he was one of the people I interviewed for the documentary orientation film I made for USC, and I had just written a screenplay, and I gave it to him, and he liked it, and... He submitted it to Touchstone, and they said, oh, this is great, and they optioned it. But then they put it into, 
you know, like a development hell. I'm sure you've heard of that. Yeah. And it never got made. I still have that screenplay and I hope I can make it at some point. But I think that when I made, you know, I wrote up against Amanda, I was just like, you know what? I do not want to go through that again. I just want to make this thing. We'll just do the best we can with what we got. And that's what we did. And then it, it got into some film festivals and Roger Corman, his acquisition person, saw it, liked it, gave it to him. They decided to release it, which was great. And it was really funny because yeah, I don't think they, they, they don't do that anymore. Roger Corman does not release independent films anymore. But at that time, so I guess our timing was, was good. And what was, what was the response? I mean, obviously it wasn't, it didn't become a blockbuster, but it, in the, in the, where, where it landed and created ripples in the pond of cinema appreciation, what were people's responses to it like? Well, at the film festivals, people liked it. You know, it was a roller coaster kind of a film to them. I, now, I think some of the details were lost on some of those. Even though festival audiences are very, they're hip, I think they still miss some of the details because, you know, even like I brought up Stephen King, that Stephen King book, Dance Macabre, is actually in the background of one of the shots when the character of Richard Pierce calls his wife at the studio. Richard Pierce also does sound like a. Stephen King character name. I didn't really put it, but that sounds. I don't know. Is, is that a tight? Is that one of a, from his rogues gallery of characters? Is that was that intentional? Not that I know of. Uh, you know, I think all of the character names are unique, but they all mean something because yeah. you know I'm a I'm a great believer that not always, but if you can, even the names should have well, it's you know, a, some it's an incredibly phallic name that you gave. Yeah, me. yeah, yes, I did. <laughs> Yeah, but then Amanda Lear is perfect. Oh yeah. For... Oh yeah. Just the shots of her looking over that fence. Again, the coverage on this. It's so much of the film happens in the in looks and reactions and point of view. Like we're watching someone and we know that it's Amanda watching or Richard watching. Like, yeah, it's so that's it's yeah, it's clearly made by an editor. And when you talk about Brian De Palma I feel like, oh, okay, I see that. This is why I love having these conversations because it just illuminates the world behind all these choices and makes you appreciate them more. Uh, well, and on my side, just speaking like in general as any filmmaker, you put something out there and you just hope there's an audience for it. You hope that there's people that like, ah, you know, all these little extra things. I, I love it. Well, that's what we're looking for an audience like you. <laughs> well, and then you have, a, you know, a, mistakes of accreditation, uh, accreditation aside, then you have these resources like Tubi that you could never have known would exist when you were making this film. Right, because it was released on VHS to video stores, which existed back then, you know, and DVD and stuff like that. And we're in a brand new world. If someone streaming. writes to that address, will we get a poster and a... Yes. Oh, okay. That's true. Yep. Oh, that great. That is true. That's great. Well, okay, listeners, get on that. Get, get your own copy. Hang up your poster of Up Against Amanda in your room and uh, freak out your partner. Oh, but even better, it'll be signed by Justine Priestley. Okay, well, then I should... Ah, I ordered mine in the wrong way. I got to get my own copy. Um, <laughs> so, okay, so... And you mentioned that you... so. You ha you made. Uh, well, she signed them a long time ago, by the way. I mean, I just I have that's, a bunch of posters. That I don't she imagine signed. you're send sending. She's a she's a busy lady. Uh, she doesn't have time to just keep autographing posters. But you have a uh, so and it's a limited edition. It's a limited. There run. you go. Yeah. yeah are, so uh, get them while supplies last. There you go. Yeah. 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 So after this, you made Edgar Allan Poe's Annabelle Lee. That's the next film after Up Against Amanda. Right. Right. And and the structure of it is totally different. So, you know, this is one of the things that was interesting for me, a challenge for me in making that movie. Also not my idea. But now I'll go off on what Annabelle Lee 
what the origin of that is and why it's interesting. And I do think it's interesting because my wife and I were on a trip in Eastern Europe and we met a man named Bill Bordy. Now, some people who are familiar with the publication Backstage, which is a, you know, a publication for uh, casting, right? they might know that Bill Bordy ran a publication called Dramalogue that was a casting publication which he sold to Backstage. And then he basically retired. He is somebody that just happened to be on this same trip with us. And if, you know, we have a website, AnnabelleLeeMovie.com, mm -hmm. that has all of these details. But we met him. He found out that I had directed this movie up against Amanda, and he told me that he'd always wanted to make a movie based on this poem by Edgar Allan Poe, the last poem he ever wrote, Annabelle Lee. And he was totally serious about it, and he said, you know, I'll produce it, and I'm, I'm interested in having you direct it. This is just from meeting a guy on a trip Not in, in Eastern Europe. It's crazy. So, you know, it's like the kind of story you go, this couldn't possibly be true. Yes, it is true. And he wound up being true to his word. And when we came back, you know, from the trip, he lives in Florida. We live in California. He flew out to California, took us out to dinner, and he said, I'm serious about this. He had a treatment that he had written uh, with a friend, you know, decades before. And he gave me the treatment. And he said, take a look at this. And then uh, if you think you can come up with something that's based on the poem, I'm serious. And that's how this thing started. So the taking a poem and trying to figure out a way to make a movie out of it is not an easy thing to do, especially something from Edgar Allan Poe, because you want to be true to the spirit of it. And yet, you know, to flesh out an entire movie screenplay is a real trick. So what I did is, you know, I kind of thought of Edgar Allan Poe as his work, his body of work beyond the poem, where, you know, he was basically the person who invented the detective story. I don't know if you knew that. Yeah. And so I thought, all right, we're going to make this a kind of a puzzle movie where all of this tragedy, this, this high romance tragedy that's the basic theme of the poem, that the love of this guy's life is dead and gone, but he's obsessed with her and he can't, he can't stop the intense uh, obsessive love that he still can't get over years and years after she's gone. We have to figure out a way to make a movie out of this. So the structure of it is a mystery. You've seen it. And the whole movie is like a puzzle that comes together. And yet there's something that you know only a few people may pick up on there is a, a lot of humor in the movie though because it, when when you take the extremes of what the poem theme are to me they kind of reach a level of gothic romanticism that is sort of unrealistic in, in the everyday world and so when you have a you know, like an arch villain who is played by Bill Bordy. I by was the just way, noticing that, yes. Okay. Then you know, I feel like it's part of my job to to throw in there winks for the audience, like his his uh servant woman. She uses alliteration on purpose when she talks to him. She's great, by the way. Yeah. She's fantastic in that film. <laughs> She handled that scene really well. You know, what, I said, go for it. What's her name? What, the actress? Lisa Wolpe. Wow. Yeah, she's yeah, she's very uh, one of those ones who just really sticks out. She doesn't have a lot. She doesn't have a lot to do in the film, but she definitely pops. Yeah. 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 So. Anyway, the, the the challenge there was that, again, you know, I wanted to the audience that you probably notice there's a lot of dream sequences in that movie. Mm -hmm. And part of the idea is to 
get the audience into a position where they're not really sure sometimes w whether they're watching something that's really happening or whether they're watching a dream or a hallucination. And even right up to the end of the movie, I'm hoping that people are not quite sure uh, because this particular character who's an artist, he's also a drinker. And it plays into something that I think is very different in the way that genres work. So you have something like Up Against Amanda, which is really snappy. I mean, the pace of that thing is really fast. And it reminds me, and you know, the blues music in that movie fits really well because it's kind of a blues story, right? Mm -hmm. um, and you experience it in time the way you experience music. You don't stop music. It just, it moves. It has a pace. It goes. But a painting, you stop. And you look at all the different, you know, parts of it to absorb it. You have to give it a little bit of time. And I had the same kind of philosophy for Edgar Allan Poe's Annabelle Lee, as I want you, especially in this day and age, to slow down. It's something that I think more people should do. And let this thing wash over you. Really let even the beauty of the, the coastline and the visuals kind of let them be absorbed in a way and slow down and think like a painter. Each little piece of this is something. And it's interesting because, you know, there's a scene uh, where he's painting the Annabelle Lee character. I'll just say it's the Annabelle Lee character. You know, there's more to it in the story. Mm -hmm. And it's very choppy. But there's a reason for that, because I want you to feel sort of disoriented, even in that scene, like you, all of these pieces are not quite put together yet. And so there's a very deliberate way of doing all this, but you have to sit and think and absorb it before it makes sense. So that's kind of what I was after with the way I made that film. Yeah. And then the end is really... <laughs> It's when when I saw Psycho for the first time, there's this vast explanation at the end, and Hitchcock gets away with it. Now maybe he got away with it because he's Hitchcock, but the truth is, and I, without get, giving anything away, you know, this movie has a similar kind of what? Now, all this information kind of comes out at the end that you you're not necessarily expecting. Yeah, and. What's the name of the actor who plays the journalist? Oh, yeah. Ken Wolt. Ken, that's Ken, Ken Wolt. Yeah. He also... He did a great job. As an actor, there's something about his scenes. Uh-huh. Uh, just, he had just lots of wonderful little physicality. Yeah, Ken Wolt is, is, he's really great. He did a fantastic job. He's a really cool dude. And uh, what I'll say something about Ken Walt is that he came from radio. Oh. And so he has a wonderful voice. Yeah. And there was even a time when I, I was wanting him to be the narrator at the beginning and end of the movie. And uh, he wanted to be. And I even had him do it. But his, he has a wonderful voice, but I just I didn't feel it was quite right for that kind character of the, to be the voice. Yeah, I didn't think it was quite right. I think that disappointed him. Bill Bordy also was interested in doing it. I'm like, ah, oh, you know, you're the villain in the movie. I really don't think that's that's quite right. So at first we had uh, John Woodward do it, and that's the one that's on the, the DVD. But going back to my roots, you know, the first 35 millimeter movie that I made with Joe Estevez, I just thought it'd be really cool because, you know, his voice is very familiar, very Charlie Sheen, uh, not Charlie Sheen, Martin Sheen sounding, who's his brother. Mm -hmm. And uh, but he has a wonderful voice and interpretation all his own, and uh, he did that for me. So I think on the one that you saw, which was the streaming one, is that yeah, correct? Yeah, the one on Vimeo. Yeah, the one on Vimeo. That is Joe Estevez's voice. I just think that would you know that's maybe a little bit of inside information because you know we have a 
that pass together where he was the soul taker. But I, there's something about it. That I thought, oh, he'd be so perfect for the narrator for an Edgar Allan Poe thing. Yeah. It, well, it, it totally works. And uh, and so are you currently developing any projects? Well, as you could probably guess, over the years I've written quite a few screenplays. And uh, the one that was optioned by Touchstone, I just still think is a great story. This uh, Battered this... Mailbox. Well, that was the short story. The title that I had it for it was Borderline. And, you know, I won't give too much away, but basically, you know, it starts out with vandalism. These These kids are just, like, out of control, and they think it's fun to go vandalizing people's property, you know, get a baseball bat. You've probably seen this before, and it's fairly common and it used to be more common that people go around a car and baseball bat and just knock people's mailboxes over it's stupid Mm -hmm. but you know it's the kind of thing dumb kids especially if they have a little bit to drink they think that's funny and it's like the instigating incident where one person goes you know this this is not cool i've had it with this and kind of decides, you know, I'm going to press charges. I'm going to catch one of these guys in the act and press charges. And it just starts this escalation of events that's insane. And I just thought that was fascinating, how things can escalate out of control. And so that's a story that I've always wanted to make. And maybe someday uh, I'll get the chance. Like I said, Randall Kleiser at one point was set to produce that with me directing it. But it, it was optioned by Touchstone. And I have the rights again. But they never made the movie. So that's one. There's a, there's a couple of others, too. But basically, I'm still a person who enjoys thrillers. And I kind of feel like thrillers have sort of gone away. Not too many great movies that uh, have that, that classic suspense thriller genre. I just feel like they're few and far between now, especially the ones that are really well made. Are there any that have struck your fancy in the last few years that you're like, oh, well, that one, that one really hit the spot? Uh, I wish I could think of one offhand. I I get sent, I'm, since I'm a member of the Guild, I get sent the movies that are up for awards, things like that. And um, I just feel like s- movies are, in a way, becoming so formulaic. I'm I'm kind of in agreement with Martin Scorsese that I'm just so tired of seeing comic book movies, and I, I like to get back to less special effects and more character, but real people with situations that are interesting. That the people themselves are really interesting. What they're trying to accomplish in life, what their goals are, and what what conflicts they're experiencing. Uh, yeah, comic book movies just. I don't know. They, they got to be really, really well done because I'm kind of tired of the the unrealistic digital effects for everything. And you know that a camera spinning around a, a building is is either digitally generated or a drone or something. It gets old. Thriller is such an interesting term. It's one. It's like one of those terms like movies that is it's sort of was created in the gutter and then was was elevated by people like Hitchcock to its own sort of masterful genre but it's still kind of hard to get your your brain around when you're trying to distinguish it from an action film or a drama or a crime drama that has action in it, it that is thrilling but is it a thriller have you ever tried to parse this and really distinguish what it is that makes something a thriller? Um, that's a good question. I, it's more like, I would say that from my standpoint, the very best suspense thrillers that Hitchcock made are kind of a goal. It's something to reach for. It's true, though, that you could make the argument that he really invented the suspense thriller because his use of visuals was so brilliant. I mean, everybody that does it right is basically building on Alfred Hitchcock. And it's like, even when I've... I am a fan of a lot of uh, Brian De Palma's work. Not all of it. You know, some of it is 
Yeah, not so great. A little over the top, maybe, you know, kind of sometimes yeah. <laughs> hitting the absurdity level or just bad taste even. Yeah. But at the same time, again, this is someone that came after Hitchcock, right? He's, he's sort of, he learned from the best and he's trying to build on that. Sometimes he does a great job. Sometimes he doesn't. But uh, we're, everybody that came after Hitchcock is, has learned something from it's Spielberg, too. You know, I mean, what a Jaws is just there's so much that you can tell that he was influenced by Hitchcock in that movie and, and even his TV movie, Duel, which is brilliant. It's a yeah. fantastic movie. There's so much you can learn just from watching Duel because there's basically, you know, just a minimum of dialogue in that movie. But it's so kinetic, it's so suspenseful and interesting and fun. But again, H Hitchcock invented that genre, and I, I think you can't get away from that. Yeah, it's one of those things about technology and time and artistry. It's like it's like with the Beatles because they were the best with emerging technology at a certain time. So many things that if you're going to use that technology and do it right, you'll end up landing where they landed. And you mm -hmm. just can't, you can, you can never be the first to that territory. And it feels like Hitchcock was that way with each innovation in camera technology and editing technology. He was able to, he just had a way of doing it that cemented, okay, if you want to create this, effect you're going to have to do do it kind of like this yeah well and it, it's also the tone that he set and the way that he uses humor yeah along with suspense and horror and shock and he just was like such a master at that that everybody else builds on it so i think what we look for is originality is always something you strive for but part of originality is just being authentic so if you know what came before and you're kind of like, oh, I love that. I hope I can do something like that in this area. You know, just be honest, have, have characters that what they're doing is organic to, to what life is today. If it's a story told in the present day. So, you're, you know, you're using elements that are part of life now that is different. And so... You take what you have and you, you know, you just want to be authentic, I think, and, and not somebody that's just tossing something out there and going, here, I, I like it or not, I don't really care. You know, you try to do the best you can with, again, what you're working with. And if you do, even 20 years later in a totally different format with people. <laughs> right. So maybe we can, it's might, a good time to wrap up. Well, might discover it and find it in, you know, find, like, I think that is the thing. That is the lesson to all artists, is that if you care and if you put in the work and do it to the best of your ability, you may seem in the moment like, wow, that was for nothing. But the good stuff does seduce you later on. It you could be it could be sitting in a used bin, like this is like in a back in the old days in a used bin in a record store or a video rack. Or in this case, somewhere like miscredited on Tubi, it doesn't matter because a great, a really well put together cinematic sequence is going to grab us. And uh, and if, if you if people are listening to this or have seen this or have seen up against Amanda and are doing their research, trying to figure out who made it and they find this, where can we send them to find out? about how they can find Annabelle Lee, where they can, if, you know, if they want to help you produce your next feature, feature, like how do people track you down and where, where can people find your work? Okay. Well, we have websites for both movies. So the one for Up Against Amanda is very old, so it really should be updated, but they can at least go there. And I, there is a link to a PO box that's real if they want to order the movie and that's at up against amanda.com that's very simple but also my name michael is i think there's a store there where you can purchase the movies that are available to be purchased and also annabelle lee has its own 
website annabelleleemovie.com. And but that's a very specific spelling. It's A N N A B E L, Annabelle, and then Lee Annabelle Lee. So Annabelle, and then the Lee is L E E movie.com. I know there's another movie that's just called Annabelle. See, and that yeah. has one E at the end and two L's. Ours also has Annabelle, uh, with the second L being part of the name Lee. So it's just the same name with an extra E at the end, AnnabelleLeeMovie.com. And I'll provide links to all of these in the show notes, because I know that I had a hard time tracking. Whoever has this, the other Annabelle Lee film, they must have a have someone doing some... Uh, SEO algorithmic work that makes sure that it's coming up first in right. searches. So uh, yeah, we'll make sure hard. that we'll make <laughs> it easier for find. the audience. One of the things that's funny because, well, now you know I'm a Hitchcock fan, obviously. I do a couple of Hitchcock Presents parodies for Annabelle Lee on the uh, on the website. If you haven't seen those, uh, I enjoy doing them. They were, they're kind of silly, but I enjoy doing them. Oh, cool. Yeah, I didn't. I'll go check that out. I didn't see those. And before I let you go, I just really should thank all of the people who put in a great deal of time and effort. The executive producer was Christopher Perez and Chuck Williams did a lot of work and a lot of his friends helped out. We had so many, you know, great actors, Justine Priestley, David DeWitt, Karen Grasso. John Allen Richards was our evil doctor. Daniel Roebuck, Willard Pugh, Skippy McGriff, mm -hmm. he knows who he is. Reggie Bannister, also our director of photography, Cynthia Pushek, did a great job. Jeffrey Ralph, costume design and wardrobe. Bob Ivey on the stunts and special effects. Maladin Malesevic composed a terrific score for us. Obviously, all these people are in the credits, but I just want to say that I appreciate all of the work. I'm always grateful for people who are passionate about the work that they do, and we had some really great people on this. I think I speak for everybody that worked on Up Against Amanda when I say, you know, you're the audience that we always are hoping for, that loves little extra details that are put in, that, you know, everybody working on the set hopes that you notice. I, I just want to thank you for being interested in the work and... My position is that it's always up to the audience. You know, we can we do what we can, but then it's like either the audience responds or, or not. And uh, I'm just very grateful for even a chance to talk about it. Dear listener, if you are just discovering our podcast, you can find all of our episodes on our website at theworldiswrongpodcast.com. You can also write to us at contact at theworldiswrongpodcast.com or follow us on Instagram at theworldiswrongpodcast. And now, back to the show. Oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, maybe we shouldn't have made fun of the, his aunt's music. <laughs> what a bunch of assholes we are. <laughs> oh, well, you know. This this is the like you said. This is the great thing about doing this podcast is that there is an actual dialogue occasionally between us, and the, we're not just yell, yelling in a vacuum. Uh, what we say does matter. <laughs> People do listen to it, so maybe we should be a little less jerky next time, uh, unless we know that everyone who's made it is dead. Like, let's, like, we can make fun of the music in Casablanca. Let's, we can do that. But <laughs> nothing made within the last 40 years. Uh, so I, I apologize uh, <laughs> for making fun of the music. But he's right. It does, like, fit into the plot a bit, the way that she's famous from this kind of... I think sure, she's going to be famous. I'm sure, his, <laughs> I'm sure his aunt, she's a professional in this business. I'm sure she has watched care. a movie. And been like, oh, God, this is terrible. And <laughs> yes, there are people there. And if they if she was on a bill with the people who made that music, she wouldn't be sitting in the front being like, boo, boo. <laughs> that ha it happened to me before with the punk book, because you know, part of the fun of writing the, that book uh, was sort of just being kind of a jerk, kind of having that punk tone of like, ah, fuck you. Who gives a shit? And making fun of things. And I felt really bad because... Both Zach and I 
were unkind to Matthew Lillard in multiple reviews. And then I met him and he was so nice. <laughs> and I was like, oh, God, I, ooh, I feel bad. And then someone was like, you should give him your book. This guy wrote a book about punk movies and your, your movies are in it. And I'm like, oh, I, I don't know if I have any copies left. <laughs> and I just felt really bad. And the same thing with uh, Richard Linklater. I wrote a very unkind review uh, for his uh, his version of Suburbia. Uh and uh, and now I work for his movie theater. So <laughs> you, you never know. You should maybe just be nice all the time to everybody <laughs> in, the, in the movie industry because you never know who you may run to and who may actually be a nice person. And then you should just feel like a real right jerk. So, <laughs> well, uh, uh, so I know that was the impact on you, but I just thought there was a lot. He, I, I love how seriously he takes what he does yeah. and I love oh, yeah. his passion yeah. for film and it was such a treat. Yeah. This is the best thing about this podcast is like you could hear that probably not enough people are asking him for his wisdom or his yeah. his expertise. <laughs> Uh, and it's just just like sitting on this well. I hope I hope he, he's he's sharing that. He's finding ways in the yeah. world to share that because it's yeah. He's I, I feel like I learned something from the conversation uh, about yeah. just make being a filmmaker. And it, and it, and his passion shows in this movie. You know, like we talk about it in the episode last week. It's like even with the limited budget, he is a real filmmaker, really thinking about everything that goes into his movie. And a lot of people wouldn't choose to do that with a low budget movie. And so that's great. He should totally teach like a guerrilla filmmaking class, you know? Yeah. Like to how you can make a really impactful film with such a small amount of st like tools, you know? Because you I can. would sign up for he, that. He proved it. <laughs> I, me too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, we didn't just get the director uh, and the writer and editor all in one person, Michael Rizzi. But uh, we we now get to hear from the star of Up Against Amanda, the amazing Justine Priestley. Let's do it. Okay. How did you get into acting, particularly professionally? Oh, that's such a cute question. I wasn't expecting you to ask that. That's a great question. Um, well, um, my mother uh, was an actor. She was in radio. She did musical theater. She was a professional ballerina when she was very young as a child. And so she was basically in showbiz and she, and her dad was, um, a vaudeville, um, like mini, you know, hoofer back when he was like five years old. Like, I know that sounds crazy, but it's true. And, um, so it kind of is in the blood. And my mom got me and my brother both into the business very, very young. Like in the 1970s in Vancouver, BC, we had an agent and we had headshots and mom would take us out of school to go to auditions sometimes. And there was only like five or six kids in the whole town that were basically the same kids were at every audition. And, um, and so that's how we got started. So I have to thank my, my mom for any, any glory that ever came of it. And then you decided to move to LA at some point. <laughs> Um, slightly more roundabout. So I was, um, I, I got out of high school and I wanted to get the heck out of Vancouver as fast as my little wallet could carry me. So I went to London, England, and I was, um, living over there and traveling and, um, doing some theater. Well, really, I shouldn't overstate it. It was more like dinner theater. <laughs> and then my brother, um, had a show called Sister Kate, I don't know if you remember that was the year before 90210. So that was 1989. And then while I was over there, 90210 started and he just like burst onto the scene. And then I, as that show blew up more and more, I was like, Hmm, maybe I should get back over to that side of the world. So I moved back to Vancouver in 92. And then I worked here, got an agent, blah, blah, blah for a couple of years. And then I moved to LA in 95, basically, um, you know, hoping to, uh, hoping to get a little of that action. And because of my name, 
I I only realize this with hindsight now. I actually wasn't really ready for LA. Like I was doing okay in Vancouver. It's very small at that time, especially like medium sized fish in a small pond. And I moved to LA and I thought I was ready and I got a lot of good big meetings. You know, you're an actor, so I can mm-hmm. t- say these kind of words to you, right? Like um, I got a lot of big meetings. I had a really big manager. Um, it was Alyssa Milano's mother was my manager. And and um, she was managing quite a lot of talent at that time. And um, and so I got all these big meetings and big auditions and I got really close on a couple things. I did. I did what are they? What did they used to call it? What do you do when you go to a, get go, a pilot? When it's you a go to network? Deal. I went to network. Yes. Thank you. I went to network. I forgot the word. And um, and then I didn't get the job. And then. After about a year, I kind of had like a lesser agent and Lisa Milano's mom wasn't my manager anymore. And I realized only looking back that I wasn't, I didn't realize that I was going to come in at that level and I wasn't really ready. Like my, I don't think my audition skills and my acting even was like good enough yet. Cause if I'd come in like a normal person without a famous brother and started at the bottom, the way most people do, then I would have been able to take the steps and get to that point. But I just went straight in and I, and I think I kind of blew it. Hmm. But so, I mean, I think every, <laughs> I think we all like everyone who's been to Hollywood or had, you know, had a taste of this has some story of like, the you know where where there's something that we missed there was some lesson that we didn't know and we wish we had when we went into it and at the same time i'm sure it it was a great adventure you know and it led to this <laughs> film are there other films are there other any roles that you are particularly proud of from that time that's really Sweet of you. I'm I'm very glad that I told you that story because I I'm so glad that you said that to me because no one's really ever said that to me before. And that makes me feel um, a little better about that experience. Um, so thank you for that. Um, yes. I mean, I have to tell you that when I was shooting up against Amanda, so I moved to L.A. in 95 and I was shooting. We were shooting this in 99 and then it came out in 2000. And some of the releases, if you're looking online, they say 2001. It's just because of the distribution and stuff that happened, the process that Rissy went through. So but it was 99 when we were shooting it. And I was like the whole time we were shooting this movie, I was like, dear God in heaven, please don't make this be the peak of my career. I really hope that this is not the peak <laughs> of my career. <laughs> and then I, in a way, I kind of think that it was. Um, and I say that because um, it's a, I, I, I am actually, I'm just going to not be humble. I am actually really proud of the work that I did in that movie. And, um, and I, and I can watch it now. And I did actually watch it quite recently because I have a newish boyfriend and he had never seen it. So, of course, I had to show it to him. Mm -hmm. And um, and uh, and I. Yeah, I think I did a pretty good job. I had a lot of fun. Like there are so many great lines that Mm -hmm. I got to say, like (laughs) so much fun. Like that one. He's mine now, bitch. You know, (laughs) like you never get to say stuff like that in a movie. Uh Um, So I really, really I did have fun doing it. Um, So, yes, I am actually quite proud of that one. Let's see what other uh, hidden gems are there. Well, my whole career is a hidden gem. So um, I don't know if you've seen any of the Melrose Place stuff. I did three episodes of Melrose Place in 96. Mm -hmm. So that was maybe the peak of my career in terms of like actual like being on a big project right and like full money and everything like i couldn't believe that set like everyone had a huge bus like every actor and i was like what whoa and like i got there i drove up to the set and there was like a parking spot for me and as a guest star and i was like what what (laughs) you know like oh this is what it's like for real actors um so um no most of most of the stuff let's see i did a really weird movie called um bottom feeders Hmm. (laughs) which you will probably never find but i have a copy of it somewhere um 
And what else did I do? I'm going to think of more things as we go through this conversation because I'm, I'm I'm blanking on really cool things I can mention. I can mention terrible things I did. That's I fine. did a movie called A, a Crack in the Floor, mm-hmm. which when we were shooting on it, when we were shooting it, we were calling it a crap on the whore. No. <laughs> um, and it has Gary Busey and um, Mario Lopez and Rance Howard. Um, All-star and cast. It's at, oh, yeah. It is the worst horror movie. I mean, it's like it's like it's like the kind of movie that when you watch up against Amanda in those first 10 minutes and you think it's going to be the worst film you've ever seen. The crack in the floor is kind of is that. Right. <laughs> Which is what distinguishes what makes up against Amanda so special. I do want to say, and I, I know you've already talked to Rissy, so so you already know this, but like a- anything that I can say about myself or anything else that's great in that film, all of the credit goes to him. Like, like he, um, because he knew what he was doing. And this is what you guys said in the podcast, which I loved so much that, that you guys like, I mean, you guys are super film files. So you know this stuff, but like he knew the story he was telling from the, you know, two years before. And, and he, he told me that he, he was, he's like, it's my favorite film or one of his favorite films is a uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And after he talked to me about it, I went back and watched it. The original one, you know, mm-hmm. from 1974 or whatever it is. And he was like, what I want is this movie to be relentless. And like every single frame makes you more involved and never lets you never lets you go like you you, it gets more intense and and it just keeps grabbing you and and that's what he wanted with this film and like there's nothing wasted and he there's no like filler i loved it when you guys said that it's so lean Mm -hmm. and i just really i i really agree with that and but it's it's all about rissy i mean I could tell you stuff about the shoot. (laughs) That's what I really, that's what I'd love to know. Yeah. Well, I mean, it was, um, I think we shot it in three weeks. Um, I'm pretty sure it was like three, six day weeks. And then we did some pickup shots um, after he had been doing some editing and stuff. Um, But I think there were four people on the crew I mean, I don't know how much Rissy, I don't want to tell you stuff that you already know. No, no, no. This but, is great. Um, yeah. So he, so he, we had um, three different houses that were all owned by friends of his in different parts of LA. And so I don't think he paid for a single set. Like, like we shot, so it was like Amanda's house and then, um, David DeWitt's house and then Chuck um, Chuck's house. Mm-hmm. And those were like that. We almost shot the whole movie in those three places. And, um, and we did, I mean, I can't tell you how many hours each day was and nobody was getting any sleep. There was a couple nights where I actually just stayed over in one of the houses. Cause we were like night and then we had to shoot in the morning. Um, it, most of it was my own clothes all the sunglasses are my own, which I'm very proud that they were all they were all mm-hmm. immortalized. <laughs> I used to have this old collection of vintage sunglasses and Rissy let me put them in. I was like, can I wear all my sunglasses, please? <laughs> I don't know if you noticed that, but um, and um, uh, his wife did all the craft service and catering. Rissy's wife. Mm-hmm. And she's a great cook and she would bring, she would make sandwiches and like make us coffee. And I mean, there was like, no, you couldn't, if you wanted to take a nap, you would just go lie down on a floor in a room that wasn't being used of the a house that we were in. It was, it was extremely unglamorous. Um, and that dog was my dog. Oh, that's, yeah, that's nice. I mean, her name was her name was Kishoho. And I always said for, for many years, you know, I'm, I'm very I'm like my dad. I just repeat myself over and over and say the same jokes over and over again. So I always said when I uh, talked about this movie that, that, that Kishoho was the best actress in the film. <laughs> well, <laughs> but she's pretty good. She she's did good. what I told her to do. Oh, she's very she good. took direction quite well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you kind of stole the show. 
And you did you did kill her early on. So <laughs> spoiler alert. Uh, spoiler the, the alert. Dog does not make it. Yeah. Um, um, so yeah. What, could, a little. What was the what was the casting process like? How did you? end up in this film did was there i mean i'm sure you auditioned oh, or what was what was that it's a great process? story too so happily and I, I i hope you've had this experience have you ever been cast in something that you didn't audition for um not not the lead in a film oh actually yes <laughs> well, actually once i had a, did have a friend it did, actually it did not go very well so uh oh. it sounds like this was better <laughs> <laughs> Bummer. Um, so I did not audition for this film. I don't even know how, but either Chuck or Rissy um, got their hands on my demo reel. You know what? I might have mailed it to them because even though I had an agent and I was in SAG at the time, and that was, oh, that's another part of the story. So like this was a non-union shoot. Obviously, um, <laughs> I got paid a thousand dollars flat fee. Which, when I did the math later, and I was talking about the, the I, I did the math of how many hours I actually worked, it turned out to be just slightly over $4 an hour. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then we did pickup shots and it went to under $4 an hour. Um, but anyway, my, my theory was like, if, if this movie does so well that I get into trouble with the union, that would be awesome. Right. <laughs> Right. Did they ever, so, did the union ever reach out? Did you ever get that call from the No, union? maybe I'll get it now. <laughs> I'm still a member. Yeah. <laughs> statute of limitations, folks. Come on. I hope so. So I think probably what happened is that they put an ad in Backstage West or something like that. Or a drama log. Remember those magazines? And yeah. I may have, I actually don't remember, but somehow they got a, ha a hold of my demo reel. But I used to send my demo reel on VHS in the mail to, to, to people that I saw who were looking for actors. Anyway, they took me out for lunch, which I thought was incredibly fancy. And Rissy and Chuck and I sat down in this diner somewhere and he had sent, oh, he had sent me the script. And so I had already read it. And honestly, I thought it was the worst script. I was just like, oh, this is just so derivative and terrible. I don't know if you can picture what that movie would have looked like on the page. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I was I like, get that. Yeah, you can get that, right? I mean, some of those lines, you know, that we all say in that movie, I mean, th thank you for the compliment of saying that we do a good job. Some of those lines are really, really hard to say, like, you know, like, um, you made, oh, you made love to me in the hot tub. Don't you remember my voice? Like, I mean, mm -hmm. <laughs> on, on the page, that just looks awful, right? Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, so I go to this meeting and... And I'm just thinking to myself, well, I just want to be an actor. So I'm not going to say no, even though I think it's the worst script ever. I'm like, I'd way rather be an actor for three weeks than work in my restaurant. So, so, you know, Rissy's like talking to me about it. But as he started to talk, I started to think that maybe he could make it a little better than what it sounded like to me when I read it. And I did understand that he had a vision and how he wanted it to be and and i started to have a little bit more hope that it could be better than what i had read you know but but honestly i just said yes because i just wanted to be an actor and and you know why not say yes to everything kind of idea and and they just hired me on the spot and he offered me a th thousand bucks and i was like sure great <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> wow. He got, they got so lucky. I mean, I don't even know. That's such a weird, because you are, I mean, I, I said this to Michael, and, but this film doesn't work if it's not you in that role. Like, and the more, like when you think of it, like it's so low budget, he's only got a thousand dollars to pay an actor. His instincts were, must've been great, Yeah. but that's just, it's lucky him. Lucky him. <laughs> <laughs> Did he tell you anything about the budget? Uh, I, I think he uh, he didn't he didn't use any numbers. He didn't say any numbers. He uh, but he he said it was a small crew and he he said it was a, a very short shoot. 
Um, it's quite yeah. obvious that, you know, you're working with, you know, with meager materials. Um, do you yeah. know what the budget was? I mean, I, 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 I don't think he would like me to say specifically, but I will tell you this, that when we, we were really, um, I thought we were very lucky. We got into a few different um, film festivals after he got it finished. And I think we drove down to like the Temecula Film Festival. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like me and David DeWitt and Karen, I think all got in a car, if I remember correctly. And it's, it's like a long drive from LA to get to Temecula. And, and, and Rissy told us whenever, and there was another screening we had in Hollywood, I forget where, something, anyway, and he, but he told us, you can't talk about the budget, you have to say that it was a quarter of a million dollars. And we were like, okay, sure. So I can only tell you that that was the lie that we told at the time, so you can Somewhere guess. between a thousand dollars. <laughs> because we know you got paid and right. a quarter of a million dollars was the budget. okay that's that's you know that's that's good enough um when you commented on one of the instagram posts that we did about up against amanda you mentioned your hair and makeup team and that's something that michael also mentioned and it was something that that's like the invisible art and craft in film is you don't until someone points out that someone had to make those decisions you just think oh well that's how she looks that's her hair and then when you think about it like, oh right. there's a lot of different hairs in this hairstyles in this film <laughs> and then wow that must have been i mean it, now you hear it's like a, a three or four person crew and yeah the uh the hair and makeup team it was it was it one person doing both or was it, it uh, there was a, a main there was a main lady her name was michelle torres and i was just looking her up actually before before our phone call here because i wanted to you know have some info at my fingertips a little more and I, her she goes by michelle elam now if i'm saying it right and she's she's still working so she was the head and she did basically all of the hair and all of the makeup and she had an assistant that was there on some of the days when we had more changes to do um but it was mostly her and we did have a lot of fun with all the hair like we we wanted a different hairstyle for <laughs> all the different like moods of amanda too like what her what what amanda's kind of like motivation was on that day you know like the one the scene where i come and i and i'm like i need a man and then it turns out that there's a spider in my bedroom mm -hmm. And I have that like little girl kind of, you know, Shirley Temple kind of curly look that you never see ever again, except for in that one scene. And so we were just having fun with the different um, styles. And she worked really hard and we were in the valley. It was hot. It was the summer. It was like June, July or yeah. something like that in the valley. No air conditioning. We the, the, the hair and makeup was being done in the garage with a fan on us. But a fan isn't very good when you're doing hair like right. it was. Yeah. And then there was a there was a wardrobe guy, too, whose name I can't find anywhere on anything. Um, but it was a lot of it was my clothes, like 75 percent of it was my clothes. Got it. Got it. <laughs> so funny. So I'm coming to work with like two suitcases, you know? Like, <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about, I mean, you've talked about just the, um, how much Michael, how much this is Michael's vision and what's great about that. But can you talk about his directing style? Huh. That's a great question. Um, I mean, he was so, he was so involved in the tech. Okay, so I am not a tech person at all. Um, and I I guess that it was shot on video. I think he told me that, but that's literally the only word that I know about what he he obviously wasn't using film. Um, but so he only had two, I think he only had himself and then two other human beings that were like camera and light. And so he um, was very busy with all of that, like all of the time. And him and I only spoke about, I mean, we did some, we did some rehearsing. So like on the days of shooting, there wasn't a lot of conversation between him and me. Um, 
because I think that we had already figured like he didn't leave time in the day for us to do that on the day. We had sort of like done that before and talked about the scenes and stuff. Um, I felt like he really trusted me. I didn't, I didn't feel, um, I didn't feel like I needed a lot from him. I felt very confident, um, in his faith in me. And, um, so I just think there was a lot of trust there. And, um, Rissy is a super sweet guy. I mean, you, you spoke to him, so, you know, he's like a really nerdy, um, super lovely like big soft hearted not big like he's a big guy but his heart is big and soft Mm -hmm. and um and he's i mean he did everything in that movie like he he's not listed as a producer but he produced it i mean he got all the people together he got all the locations i mean he did everything and and he um, I think he really hired people that he felt like he could trust because he had to, because he couldn't, you know, he had to ha- know that like certain things were taken care of. Like he knew that I knew my lines and he knew I was going to hit my mark. And he knew that we had had conversations about how, how we wanted things to be. Um, but it was a very, it was, it was a real team effort. I mean, we were all <laughs> at the end of our rope by the end of each day, you know, it was really, uh, it was really supportive and really everyone was pulling their weight and doing things that, you know, isn't technically in their department or whatever it was. And everyone was happy to be there. It was all like, you know, inexperienced, more inexperienced, you know, crew. And me too. I was young. I was only like 30. I don't know what I was 30. Yeah, 30 or 31. So I hadn't done a lot of, I, I'd never been a star of a film like that. So I was happy to be there, you know? I yeah. Felt excited about it. With films like that, I've had the experience, like on a film where everyone's working for free or almost free, the morale seems to be so much better than on a film where people are getting paid something but not enough. Like they're, people are there for the money, but it's not enough money to make them happy to be working extra hard and, or even on a big budget thing where there's just, there's a lot more politics and push and pull. And there is something about being on a low budget film where everyone's just down to make this movie. And they know that there, that there isn't a, you know, several million dollars somewhere where, you know, that someone is making off of this, off of their labor. And, uh, so I, I'm glad to hear that the, that it was a good vibe on the set, even though, as you say, it was hot and difficult. Uh, yeah, it was certainly wasn't easy, but um, but I'm I'm glad to hear you. I'm I'm happy. I'm really happy. I'm really happy we're having this conversation again because the way you put that that the morale on set that was that's exactly the way. That's a great word for it. It was it was good. Um, yeah. Yeah, I I haven't hardly ever been on a really uh, big film set. I don't think I ever have been on a full on Spider Man level um, film set. So, but I have uh, my boyfriend right now is a is a sound editor here in Vancouver, and he, I don't know the stories he tells me now of the of of the vibe on on most sets. He he's really. St- I mean, he's been in it forever. He's in his fifties too, right? So he's been doing it forever. Maybe he's a bit jaded, but, <laughs> but you know, he, he really struggles with it. And that's at the very high level stuff. Cause there's so much politics and there are so many egos. I mean, that's my interpretation. There's so many egos and there's so many competing like agendas. Everybody wants different things. Right. But on a set, like up against Amanda, everybody wants the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now I'm curious, you, I, I, I take it that you're not actively in the business currently, but I also know that once you've been in the business, you're kind of always, at least for myself, like people ask me, like, did you, when did you quit acting? I'm like, I haven't quit acting. <laughs> <laughs> Just try me, ask me to act. I'll do it. <laughs> uh, so I'm curious if, if, you know, this fi- if if this podcast about this film draws more attention to it and people are looking at it and they're thinking, yeah, this 
this Justine Priestley. She's uh, she's special. Maybe well, do you think she'd would she be in our movie? Would you would you would you still date Amanda? To act? Amanda at fifty four. <laughs> um, well, okay, so I, I will tell you a little story about that. That's a good question. Um, so I kind of officially quit in '04. Um, and I could tell you some stories about that if you want to hear them. But um, then in, I moved back to Vancouver in 2016 um, because of my beloved and elderly parents and i wanted to be closer to them because i'd been away for so long from living in vancouver 27 years that i didn't live here um so i came back here and then and then i was in vancouver which is still i mean it's a busy city for for filming but it's still kind of medium fish small pond around here and i was just starting to think hmm maybe i'll get an agent Maybe I'll get some headshots. And I was taking acting classes um, in like 2018 and 2019. And I was just going to get ready to maybe dip my toe back in it. And then COVID. Dun, dun. Yeah. So then I lost my restaurant career. Oh, I wanted to say to um, you and I think it was Justin that was on the episode about mm -hmm. Amanda, right? And you guys are both bartenders. Uh, I am no longer, but he still is. I guess it's he like an actor. Is. I guess I'm like, I, I could still be a bartender if someone wanted me to get behind a bar. But uh, I think you're always a bartender. You yeah. know, once you've been a pickle, you can't go back to being a cucumber. Right. Um, <laughs> so um, I was a bartender for all of those years. I mean, I, I was a bartender until the pandemic hit. I was managing it, a bar and, and bartending here in Vancouver. Um. So we have that in common. Um, but yeah, so then, but of course, then the restaurant bar situation went in the tank. And um, I was like, what should I do with my life? What if bars never come back? Oh, no. So I went and got my real estate license. Mm -hmm. Well, and how is that? <laughs> it's interesting. I'm working with my mom. She's been a realtor since 1984. So I'm, I'm trying it out. Um, you know, it's a very different, wildly different um, thing to do, you know. It's more um, of like a grown-up um, job. Like acting yeah. and bartending are still very like, woo, kind of <laughs> show busy <laughs> kind of jobs. But yeah, real estate is like, you know, you're not going to buy a house yeah. from the same kind of person you're going to buy a drink from. Exactly. That is very well put. Um, yeah. So, um, you know, so I try to dress up and, and, um, you know, have a professional demeanor. I, I'm not a realtor, but I play one on TV, maybe something like that. Um, yeah, no, it's been, it's a big shift. It's a really big shift for me, but that's what my YouTube channel is about. So there's where the crossover is because I um, started a, a real estate YouTube channel to, you know, put myself in the world as a realtor and as an expert on all things Vancouver, which is really cool because I've had tons of fun um, researching different things and making videos about Vancouver itself and learning to be a content creator and doing everything myself. So I shoot, I edit, I do the sound, I do the production, I, do, you know, I do the thumbnails, I do the graphics, I do the <laughs> sound effects. Like, so I know you understand what that's like. And that's been kind of fun because that's tapping back into, you know, that part of my life. And, and, and um, so it's kind of like got both in it. So you're becoming a director, it sounds like. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, who knows? Maybe one day you'll find yours. You'll be like, I, you know what? I need to make my own up against Amanda. I have three friends with houses. Uh, <laughs> but uh, so you didn't really answer my question. Are you? Oh, if someone was a huge fan of Up Against Amanda, it was like, oh, we we have a role for her in the, in a film. Obviously, not playing Amanda again, but playing, you know, <laughs> playing some other role. Uh, it, would you, are you still interested in being an actor or is that just, is that chapter closed? Uh, I think I, I, 
I think I would consider it. It would really depend on quite a few things, but um, it sounds really fun. I would love to be back on a set, but I would also, I have to admit, I would be very, very nervous because I don't know if I know how to act anymore. It's been so long. Mm. And you, you, know? you alluded to it and you don't have to tell us, but would you like to tell the story of what happened in 2004 that made you... <laughs> oh well that that wasn't anything in particular but i do want to tell uh um a michael Rissy story so i went back to la in 2004 and this is not why i had i had actually already quit because i was living in new york and that was the last time that i was like calling myself an actor and then i was gonna move i was moving back to la to open a bar actually because a boss that i had in in new york wanted to open a bar in la and i had been bartending for him and he said i'll i'll open a bar with you you manage it you find a location so i went to la and that's what i was trying to do and rissy approached me and he had written a script about camera girls so so he's always very tech, like, and I know you guys talked about that in the podcast too, up against Amanda at the time in 1999, all the tech was really cutting edge and not just the tech that he was using to shoot the movie, which I, I don't know about it, but he told me at the time and I believe him that it was really, really new stuff that very few people had, had made a feature with this kind of digital, you know, um, stuff. And, and, um, and so now cut to 2004 and remember like the internet was really new and everyone was talking about like women making money by putting cameras in every room in their house and then guys pay to like watch. Do you know what I'm talking about? Camera yeah. girls. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so, and that was like this kind of new idea that people were talking about. And I guess, I don't know if it was real or anything, but Rissy had written a script about it and he and he said that he wrote this part for me and I was like so flattered and 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 you know we had had a good time working together and everything but I was just like so done with being an actor and I have to also say like being asked to be naked that one would have had more nudity I think in mm -hmm. it and I was just because Here's something that I want to say that I don't know. I'd never hear actors say this, but like I was basically hungry for like 12 years of my life because I was always so nervous about gaining weight. And my agents would say to me, hey, Justine, you know, audition for blah, blah, blah. Make sure you wear a bikini under your clothes in case they want to see you in yeah. it. Mm. So. I spent literally 12 years of my adult life just just hungry. I was just always hungry. And when I quit in 04, one of the things I swore to myself, I was like, I'm never going to be hungry again. When I want to eat, I'm just going to eat. And then, Scarlett O'Hara. <laughs> yeah. I will never, then, ever go hungry again. <laughs> yes uh, nor will i um, wear this damn corset oh <laughs> <laughs> no more false eyelashes never um so then rissy bless his heart and it wasn't I, I was just like picturing oh no i have to be naked and i don't want to act and it's just so tiring and i just ugh. and so i turned him down and um and that uh, that kind of always stuck with me that I really honestly had quit in my heart of hearts because uh, when a director that you know can make a good movie tells you that he wrote a script with you in mind and you still say no, I was, yeah, that was, it was a, a, a line in the sand, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes yeah, got to have good boundaries. You got to know, got to be able to say no to things. Um, but, yeah, it you know, was good for me possible. to do that at there's the time. A, there's a director out there who's listening to this and thinking, <laughs> oh. maybe she'll say yes to me. So sure, who knows? Who knows? give me a call. Let's talk. Um, <laughs> well, I ha so I I'm sitting on a story that I feel like I need to tell you. <gasps> good. So I you you mentioned going to network. I mm -hmm. had I had an experience going to network. Uh on this little show called 90210. <gasps> yes. Uh, I, 
I went to I went to network for that for your brother's role with him. Uh, there were four of us. You're kidding me. And it was it was a wild week. So I the the day before going to network, I was in Aaron Spelling's office auditioning with Shannon Doherty, and we had a real <gasps> spark. It was like that. It the scene just worked, and they were like they worked out our deal. We went to network. And I'm sitting there, and your brother's there, looking great, by the way, looking really good. <laughs> and uh, and this other guy showed up, another dark-haired actor, and Shannon went, ran up to him and was like, hey, I'm so glad you're here. I really hope you get the part in front of <laughs> us. And I was like, uh? uh? And so while I'm sitting there thinking about this, your brother is telling a story and it always stuck with me because he's like, you know, the earlier, like just the other weekend, I don't know if he was talking, I don't think, he, I don't even think he was talking to me. I think he was talking to someone else there, but I was, you know, we're all in a room it's like that. Just, yeah. And he's like, yeah, this last weekend I was going to go skiing and I was driving in my car and this guy came up to me on the street and put a gun in my face and stole my skis. And I was just sitting there just thinking, Oh, this guy's going to get the role. He is. He just had a gun in his face. He's not nervous about anything. He's looking great. He's so calm. And but at the same time, I'm thinking, oh, but that other guy, Shannon, really wants him to get the role. I go in and she just tanked the audition. She tanked it. She completely she didn't give me anything that she had given me the day before. And I was like, oh, that other guy's going to get it. And then when I didn't get it, but then it was Jason who got it. I was so, I mean, I wasn't happy. I didn't, I was bummed that I didn't get the role, but I was so happy that that other guy that Shannon was trying <laughs> to help get the role that he didn't get it. And this guy who had this amazing story <laughs> that he got it, but I've always, and, and so I've, I haven't told that story for years and years. I used to tell that story a bunch, but I have to ask you, did he ever tell you a story about a carjacking or did he just make that up in the audition? I mean, I think that's a thing you tell your family. I got carjacked. That is such a good, such a good story. I'm so glad you told me that. I have a memory of him being carjacked. Yes. Okay. Um, I don't know. What, uh, you know, I can't really corroborate it properly, but that's not coming out of a blue sky for me. That's, I think, a real story. Yeah, I believed. I didn't think. I mean, I just. Was there more than him in the car? Do you remember? I don't. I, just, I think there were other guys in the car. Yeah, I don't. Rem all I remember is he's going. He was going skiing. He had a convertible. A guy came up, put mm -hmm. a gun in his face and said, I'm taking your skis. Jeez. And yeah, I was just like. <laughs> Man, wow! This is like it was just. Uh, he just seemed so grounded, and like I was like, why didn't someone put a gun in my face this week so I could be Aww. like that? <laughs> <laughs> Andres, anyway. I'm sorry that you lost oh, out no, to my brother no, for no, that no, part. Actually, I've, no, 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 no. I have not. Uh, I have. I really have. That's not one of those things that I have regretted. There are other things that I regret. Yeah. Uh, choices I made. Okay, but not that one. No, I what? not, not what? even in a bad way. Just things that like that was all fair game. That was a good experience. Definitely the right guy got that role. And Right. You know, I, yeah, he was meant to be in that role, that's yeah. for sure. Yeah. There was yeah. no, so I there are other things where there are things that I turned down or bad or choices I, you know, ways I behaved when I did get things sometimes that weren't mm -hmm. as cool as I would like to have been. You know, didn't I again mm -hmm. I wish that I had better people around me to like say either to say, tell me things that I should have been told or tell me the things that I needed to hear in a way that I could hear them. But no, no, with that, it's just that was just this moment. And uh, yeah, I just I, I felt like I had it's funny because I talked with uh, Brian and Justin. I was like, have you if I told you my Jason Priestley story? And they're like, no, no, because I'll t I'm going to tell it to Justine and then you'll hear it on the podcast. So, Yay. Uh, so anyway, oh, thanks I'm glad for to know, letting me be the one. That's great. <laughs> I'm glad to know that that wasn't a made up story and uh, and that it, uh, you know, that 
it's a good thing to remember if any if bad things happen to you like get like i think getting carjacked is a bad thing it also mm -hmm. could be the foundation for the next amazing thing that happens and that's a good lesson mm -hmm. that i took from it yeah i think that's very wise as, and and what you say like not being nervous like not being scared of anything like that'll just reset your whole mm -hmm. gauge of what matters yeah yeah so cool were you in that tell me if you were in because i did um get to go into aaron spelling's inner office with that thick thick yep. shag carpet yep yes! that was the one the white was it the best yeah. office ever so crazy like something out of one of his shows yeah yeah and that big long couch so you can get like eight people sitting there and you're standing on the thickest part of the carpet that's where i was sitting with shannon doherty when <laughs> Wow, that's great. Yeah, I had to go to that room. It wasn't network, but for the Melrose, for the Place, Melrose Place job yeah. that I that I got a couple of years later. Um, yeah, fun. Um, and on that note, I do want to just say um, that in the podcast, um, the Up Against Amanda episode, you guys did um, disparage my brother a little bit. And all I want to oh, say no. is... Oh, no, did we? What no, did we, we just, did we say we're better bit. than him? Oh, no, yeah. Well... <laughs> Which, you know, <laughs> I'm not going to complain about that. That's a lovely thing for you to say. That, um, that, we're just but... saying you're really good. We're not saying he's bad. We're saying he's very good. He is very, very good. <laughs> Great, even. You're just better. Okay. But, uh, <laughs> well, I wanted to say that maybe perhaps you guys haven't seen uh, a movie he did called Cold Blooded. I bet Brian has seen Cold Blooded. I've seen I've seen the poster. I liked him in what was the, I saw, there was another one that he was in that was really good. Love and Death on Long Island. Uh huh. With John Hurt. What is yeah 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 no I, I we I, I'm sorry we this is I, we no no did don't this, apologize no no we kind of did this <laughs> with uh with uh, Michael's aunt and her music too and it's it's the kind of thing <gasps> did that is that Michael's aunt I forgot yeah and I just oh oops <laughs> I feel like <laughs> it's, it, this is part of the fun of talking about movies is you yeah you can kind of push at them and you kind of like even a movie yeah. you love you can be like yeah but blah 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 da, 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 da. but totally. then when you talk to the people you're like eh, they're that's they're human beings they have <laughs> right they well wanna... that's why i'm saying please don't apologize like because it's all in good fun and 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 if and when my brother listens to the podcast he he won't be offended at all like he's a he's a super chill like you you can't bug him with that kind of stuff he's fine but 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 i just wanted but to you're mention your sister cold... and you're standing up for your brother i appreciate that that's good yeah and and i want to say cold-blooded and i want to say love and death on long island and i want to say i don't know if you know that he also directs but he directed a, a film a couple years ago called um uh Kaz and Dylan, like C A S, it's the name of a character, Kaz and Dylan. Mm -hmm. And it's um Richard Dreyfus and um he hired Melania. Uh oh, I'm forgetting her name. She was the actress in Black Orphan. Did you ever watch Black Orphan? Hmm. Where she plays all the different twins, all the different clones of herself. Mm, no, Tatiana I... Maslani. Tatiana Maslani is her name. Okay. No? No, hmm. I don't I don't I need to this is there's so much movie. There's so many movies out there. There's so much out there. We it's true. We, we can know it all, but we can't. Actually, your brother's directed a lot of stuff. At, I'm looking at it. I'm looking at his. Uh, he has. IMDb right now, and yep, you know, he's directed he cast, a lot of stuff. He cast my favorite, one of my favorite actors, a, an actor who the world, I, who I feel like the world is wrong about, the great Richard Dreyfus. Not enough people. Yes. Yeah, he, it's not like he doesn't yes. work a lot, but I just feel like he doesn't quite get the same love as a lot a lot of actors from the 70s and i think he was as good if not better yeah. than most of most of them i Cast i would and... totally agree with you there and and this you know i don't know he must be set what is he now 78 79 so mm -hmm. so i think they shot that movie in 2018 so he you know this is richard dreyfus as an old man old man old man dreyfus yeah, uh, okay. with my brother at the helm. So just saying. Well, uh, giving some props to the JP. Yeah, yeah. Hey, 
I, I, you know what? It, so, I don't. Somewhere in all this conversation, somebody at some point was like getting the Justine Priestley, Jason Priestley, Justine Bateman, Jason Bateman <laughs> thing. I'm sure you've heard yes. that before. Has anyone ever tried to just put you all in a movie together? Oh God, that would be great. Listen, if if any of those people want to be in a project with me i'm i'm jumping at that one yeah when jason and i were little jason and justine bateman each had their own tv show like in the early 80s when we were all like 12 or 10 or whatever we were and jason and i used to joke with our mom saying that that we were switched at birth and that's the wrong justine and jason that we're the ones that are supposed to have the tv shows and and these people are supposed to be nobodies in canada (laughs) nobody's come on <laughs> you were the big fish in the mid the medium-sized pond You're- i i well i did a i have to say now just because i just remembered it and it's one of my favorite early childhood actor memories so i got hired to do a super value commercial when i think i was probably seven and in those days william shatner didn't have a pot to piss in well i'm not sure that's true but i don't think he had a lot of work because it was after star trek but before star trek movie Mm -hmm. and he was the spokesman for super value grocery stores which are i believe a canadian chain you know he's a canadian Mm -hmm. so he was doing these these super value commercials and nobody thought he was cool at all and um i got to do a commercial with him and how did it go? He was such a dick. <laughs> you must he was so mean be to me. Was he? No. no. He was so mean to me. Oh. Yeah. Uh, well. And it... I was supposed to be smiling and he was just like, mruh, mruh, grumpy old man, you know. <laughs> In retrospect, though, do you kind of appreciate that? Like if he like if he was nice, if he was just a nice guy, there's not much. To, rem- to remember there, like a grumpy William Shatner picking on you when you were a kid, as long as it wasn't Great too story. traumatizing, it seems like that's the better Bill Shatner story. Absolutely. So, Bill, wherever you are, thank you for that. You're welcome. <laughs> um, yeah. Oh, I know what I wanted to say. Yeah. You know the American flag bathing suit? Yes. That is Rissy's wife's bathing suit. Her bathing suit, your sunglasses. Correct. Whose cigarette? <laughs> oh, that was so nasty. I hated having to smoke that thing, but that was a great line. Yep. Yeah. And then somebody stole it. Okay. See if you can be this guy. I think that in, I just listened today to the very first episode that you guys did Mm -hmm. the two and a half hour long one where you did the lists and everything. Because I just wanted to do, I, cause like, you know, yesterday in our text, I said, can I ask you questions about yourself? I figured I'll just go back to the beginning of the podcast. I'll probably learn a lot. So I listened to that whole episode and you said somewhere in there, I think that you're the guy where if somebody goes, you know, that 1970 movies, 1970s with Elliot Gould and there's like women Mm -hmm. and then you're like, oh, it's this. Yeah. Okay. Do you remember a movie from the early or mid aughts and it has um, Susan Sarandon's daughter and... I think Macaulay Culkin, although it may have been Kieran Culkin, and it was like all these high school kids, and it was a really weird. Was it Iggy Goes Down? Was yeah, it? maybe. And but they stole the line from Rissy, where they go, "It's not the smoke that kills; it's the it's not the secondhand smoke that kills; it's the smoker." Huh. They literally stole his line. Huh. I don't know if it's what well, Dig- Digby goes down or not, but I can probably figure it out looking up Susan Strandon's daughter. What's her name? You know that? Eva Amuri is her name. Yes. And yes. And I'm looking at her filmography. The, the Education of Charlie Banks. It sounds like that would probably be it. Yes. I think that's it. Who directed it? Uh, that is directed by Fred Durst. The musician. Oh, weird. Yes. With Jesse Eisenberg and Jason Ritter. Yes. 
Yes, 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 yes. I'm I'm 99% sure that's it. In that movie, they stole Rissy's line. And I went and saw it the theater. And then I like called Rissy up and I was like, can we sue them? Like, what are they? They stole it. No, can't sue them. Fred, a word, a, a word of advice, Fred. You do not want to mess with Amanda. <laughs> she, she killed her own dog. She killed the dog. She killed the doctor. She killed Chuck. She, is, <laughs> you don't want to mess with her, Fred. Just That's look good out. advice, Fred. You should, you, know, you're, you should just steer clear of Vancouver. <laughs> not, not safe for you. Not safe for you. Uh, <laughs> Well, uh, well, I hope that we can meet in person one day. Maybe we'll meet at the Up Against Amanda screening in Seattle. I certainly hope so. By the way, did you write the music for the the world is wrong? Yeah, huh? that's me. I love it. Thanks. I Thank love you. it. I love it so much. <laughs> oh, I know another story I wanted to tell you. Sure. I was waiting for Brian to say this. So he, he teased at the end of the of the Up Against Amanda podcast um, that he was going to say what his personal connection was to it. Oh, that and was his um, heard... Emmanuel thing. That, that yes. Basically, yes. So, go on. so the first time I listened to the podcast was Tuesday and I didn't I hadn't heard the very first one. But t this morning I heard the very first one. So then when he said that about Emmanuel, I was like, oh, my God. But what I thought he was going to say is that him and I are friends. What do you mean? We can't. Me and Brian, Con unless it's a different Brian Connolly. Are, is there more than one Brian Connolly? No, it has to be the same guy. You he, he camped with me at Burning Man. No, no, this like can't two, be the same. Two guy. years? Are you sure? I, 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 I have. A it looks like him. It even looks like him. I thought I was texting with him about it. Just I can't ch do it now because I'm using my phone for this call. But oh my god! So there maybe there are two Brian Connollys. Okay, then that's fine. I, uh, I would, <laughs> I would love to think that Brian Connolly, that my my Brian Connolly had spent time at Burning Man, but I, uh, I just I don't <laughs> see I don't see that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to reach out to my Brian Connolly and say, are you not this Brian Connolly? Yeah. And and we'll straighten that out. Because I, like, there's my ego, right? I was like, oh, he's totally going to mention us meeting at Burning Man on, on a dance floor at like four in the morning, like no, hair no, standing this, on end. This is not Brian. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Oh, that's so funny. Okay, well then that makes this even more random. I like yeah, it. I think I, Brian generally, I think he's an early to bed, early to rise kind of guy. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's funny. Uh, um, Andras, I have had a lovely time chatting with you. Thank you very, very much. Radio Eight Ball. Andras here. When I'm not co-hosting the World is Wrong podcast, I'm hosting and producing the Radio 8 Ball podcast, where we answer questions by picking songs at random, like picking musical tarot cards. We've hosted musical divinations for people like John C. Riley, Patricia Arquette, Tig Notaro, and Fred Armisen, and hosted over 200 songwriters providing the randomly chosen answers from Inara George and Dan Byrne to Mose Allison and Alan Toussaint. That's Radio 8 Ball, all one word. You can find us wherever you get your podcasts and download our app from the iTunes App Store. Oh, that was great. Was it you? <laughs> was it what? you in, Bri in Burning Man? That was you. You met her, you danced with her. <laughs> you crazy was... wild man. It was the most memorable evening of my entire life. <laughs> no, I've never, I've never been to Burning Man. I will never go to Burning Man. I've never even thought about going. But it's so funny how she, I, I want to say for probably what, a week now, she's been convinced that this is true. So <laughs> I do kind of like in my mind, this fantasy that happened of her looking at a picture of me and hearing my voice and somehow thinking it was this other Brian Connolly that she met who knows how long ago. <laughs> I don't think she understands how old I am. <laughs> I don't think she understands what type of part, but that's fine. I found that really great and adorable. Uh, and you know what? <laughs> More power to you, other Brian Connolly, for approaching uh, you know, Justine Priestley, or maybe she approached him at Burning Man and having a fun uh, a clearly memorable evening. 
<laughs> and clearly we look the same, I guess. <laughs> I don't know if she's... Do you think she's basing it off the cartoon <laughs> of me? I guess the drawing on, that's on her Instagram post with the beard and the glasses, which I don't really look like that because it's a cartoon. <laughs> In my mind, I hope like that's what this other Brian Connolly... Uh, and hopefully this other Brian Connolly is listening because, you know, it's always good to to, to hear about a fellow Brian Connolly. <laughs> yeah, I, I got the impression, and maybe I'm wrong, but I think that, like, I, you don't know this. I haven't been to Burning Man, but I know a lot of people have been to Burning Man, and they have camps, like, large groups of people who go there. It's more like, like almost like yeah. a film crew or a stage crew that goes there all together, and they do some art project. And I kind of got the sense that he had been, he camped, this Brian Connolly camp with her group for a couple of years. I think she said that. But that she had, they oh. did have a memorable... <laughs> dance into the wee hours but i think that that was just sort of like every night at burning man is dancing into the wee hours i i would i I love love to imagine that this is that somewhere in your life there's like there's so many things that are unlikely about that scenario the idea that they could all converge into one like it's like this is like your after hours. Like when you were living <laughs> your version of after hours, you found yourself at Burning Man dancing with Justine Priestley at four in the morning. <laughs> well, it's funny when she said, I can't believe Bryant didn't say this other secret. And I'm like, what is she talking about? And then she's like, we know each other. We're friends. And I'm like, and then there was a moment of like, do I know her? Wait, how do I know her? Like, okay, she's from Vancouver. I'm from Washington State. And I just kind of, for like, there was a good five seconds where I was like, mm-hmm. did we go to school or how, like Evergreen or what? What? Like, am I just a terrible person? I don't remember her. And then, no, she just is totally wrong. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> it just... It's just so funny because anyone that knows me for even half a day knows that I would never be the person dancing with anyone at Burning Man. <laughs> you, you are not the person, like, you're not the kind of person who would be dancing. Stop there. With anyone. Stop at Burning Man. Okay. That that late. <laughs> no, I'd be like, it's nine o'clock. It's this I need I'm going to bed. <laughs> This is why you would never go to Burning Man because at nine o'clock it's like you're at a like I haven't been there, but it's like a, a constant rave. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so far, like I've just begun kind of my film festival, you know, experience with my movie, and I seriously am like skipping the late night parties because I'm like I'm tired. I'm gonna go to bed and I just go to the hotel like an old man, and but then I wake up at like seven in the morning. So, <laughs> but I feel great. But I'm not I'm not a party function sort of dude. This is not really my thing. Uh that's this is why I'm hosting a movie podcast. I spent my entire life watching television. <laughs> so that's what I do, not dancing with beautiful women in the mud of Burning Man. <laughs> <laughs> Though maybe I made the wrong life path. Maybe I need to like swap with the other Brian Connolly and go back in time and do a, a looper sort of thing where I can <laughs> I'm what's gonna, Burning Man Brian Connolly like? I don't know. I'm going to guess that neither of you would like the switch. <laughs> I think yeah. you are both in the right timeline. Yeah, I agree. All the Brian Connollys are in the right place. <laughs> but but uh, apart from that, that was a great interview. Both these interviews were great. I think this is just uh, proof that not everything on social media is bad because like we posted uh, our first post about uh, Amanda a week and a few days ago. She res- we, we, we tagged Justine on it. She responded within that day and had kind of a little dialogue in the comments. And then here we are a week later. She's in the episode. It's great. I want, I hope that keeps happening in season three and four and whatever. Like, that is a great way to interact. That is so f- cool. That's so fun. And do you want to apologize to Jason Priestley, Brian, for all the shitty things you said about him? Did I no, say anything? I don't, I don't think you said anything. I, think I have I, no problem I with think him. It was probably me and Justin. <laughs> I have a feeling it. Uh, I, uh, <laughs> I highly recommend people watch his episode of uh, SNL that he hosted. Really. It's good. It's really good. It's uh it's it's all it's all a peacock. 
I believe. What, what's, and, a, what's a particular bit from it that was amazing? Maybe I'll, I'll throw it I'm on. trying to remember. I, I, I seem to recall I watched it on a, um, a, uh, at a slumber party when it aired back in the early 90s, whenever that was. And, uh, and it's like that was prime era. There was just like Adam Sandler and like Chris Farley and all those guys. And uh, it's just, it's a good episode. It's really, like, he's really funny. I, I don't, I, I don't remember exactly what the skits were. I, I know they did like, I think he does some, I think he does some ice skating in it because he knows how to do that, you know, being a Canadian and all. <laughs> They for, yeah, right? they, they teach you that in, in and, preschool. And they do, um, yeah, and there's like, a, I think there was like, a, there might have been a Gap Girl skit, or I think there was definitely a Sprockets skit, which I was always a big fan of, where Mike Myers played the uh, German art guy. Mm-hmm. Doing, <laughs> and, yeah, and the musical guest was Teenage Fan Club. Oh. So, I think... Check it out. It's good. It's, uh, I remember that's, I remember because, like, I was a kid growing up when 902 was popular. And I remember just hating it because all the girls just talked about how much they love Jason Priestley and how much they love Luke Perry. And I was just, you know, a young boy. So I was like, you are all dumb. This is stupid. And then I saw his SNL and I was like, oh, this guy's good. I, I can't hate this guy. He's funny. Like, this is great. And, uh, Justine is right. Like uh, Love and Death on Long Island is so good. That is a I haven't thought of that movie in a long time. That is a great movie. Have you seen that movie? Yeah, that's one I was thinking of. Yeah, it's really good. It's uh no yeah, and I kind of want to watch that Richard Dreyfus movie he directed. Like I'll I'll not turn down some Dreyfus. <laughs> but, but hey, we did it. Another. Uh, this is the first time we've done this where we had two weeks in a row on the same kind of subject matter usually we do these bonus episodes way later yeah so it was cool to be able to follow it right up yeah yeah uh we did it we've you want, unpacked that movie more than anyone ever has you want to know i guess this just to, to be complete about this so i told on um, in that episode i told my uh auditioning for or going mm-hmm. to network on, on yeah on 90210 they brought me back a, the next year to audition for the the role that would eventually be Luke Perry. Oh. <laughs> and it is the most embarrassing I think my most embarrassing audition story and <laughs> tell uh, it. <laughs> and it is an example of the world being wrong and in this case okay. me being that world which is wrong and being so <laughs> Okay, so I'm auditioning. I forget who the casting director was, but obviously she was someone who liked me and was on my side Mm -hmm. and had already like, like, yeah, she was my ally when I walked in. Yeah. (laughs) Um, And in it, there is he's the character says the line, oh, I don't. Uh. Something about Cretans. I don't like he's he's a snob and he's like, oh, Cretans who read that, who don't get this book or whatever. Let's say it like Cretans who don't understand Moby Dick and its metaphors. Except that I said Cretans because (laughs) I had heard probably because I learned the word from some movie like uh, like Animal House, where the people who say the that word are being mocked for saying it in a hoity-toity, shitty way, <laughs> in, incorrectly. Yeah. But it was the only way I knew. And so I said, cretins. And she said, no, actually, it's pronounced cretins. And I was like, no, I'm pretty sure it's cretins. <laughs> She's like, uh... Goodbye. No, it's cretins. <laughs> I was like... Ah, I'm I, it like I didn't say this, but my manner was ugh, I'm smarter than you. Like I'm smarter than everyone in Hollywood because everyone in Hollywood is dumb and I'm just like this golden child. Oh, man. And <laughs> it's she has forgotten. I am sure she has forgotten me and she has forgotten that interaction. <laughs> I will take it to my grave. 
it is just, was one of those things where uh, every few months I just like if you're if you had a camera on me every few months I just wince for, like I'll be driving and it'll come that'll flash across my mind and it will <laughs> look to someone who's sitting next to me as if I like as if I like I'm passing a kidney stone for a second. <laughs> Um, I say words wrong all the time, as uh, you know, because you constantly correct me. Yes, yes. <laughs> but I'm always quick to be like, you're right. <laughs> I don't know what I'm talking about. I would never argue that I thought I knew how to say it. Oh, <laughs> <Correct. it's> what <laughs> a, oh. You blew it, kid. I don't like it's not even that. Yeah. I. You know what is it's, it's what it's weird <laughs> is I don't even like I don't regret not getting that role. Like, yeah. The roles that I didn't get, I, I don't regret. I think you can't like as yeah. an actor, you just... You can't live like that, you know, enjoy yeah. the ones you get yeah. and know that you yeah. were the right person for them. And the ones yeah. you didn't enjoy the process. And but yeah. but just that arrogance and just <laughs> that it was so, it's so revealed in that. And it makes me feel like how many other things that I don't remember. Did I bring yeah. that attitude into <laughs> those interactions? And I just I'm like. <laughs> Yeah, that's a symptom. Yeah. That's not a. That's a symptom of something else. You <laughs> that that the world I hope is beaten out of me. And uh, yeah, <laughs> so great. Uh, okay, well, uh, so let's see. Anything else? Any final words on up against Amanda, Brian? I I think we did it all. I think we truly unpacked the hell out of that movie, which is great. And now people can put it out on like a special edition Blu-ray. Yeah. Come with on. all these extra features as they should. Come to the party. Come join us on Tubi. First of all, Tubi, get your shit together. Get yeah. Get those credits weird. right. Did you know that <laughs> film or did you look it up? Oh, I asked Jeeves. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well i was like that like that's got to be another movie it's like this like timothy bottoms like i was like wait a minute and i just i looked it up like you know the internet so i just pretend that i know all these things about movies but really i'm just using my phone you didn't pretend much i just asked you <laughs> i know <laughs> okay so uh yes to be get that straightened out <laughs> pronto but in the meantime people come join us the movies on tubi tubi is free it's called up against amanda if you want to get it on DVD, you can get an autographed poster of Justin Pre Justine Priestley from 20 years ago. It's, you know, <laughs> this movie's just waiting for you. So, yeah. uh, and uh, yeah, well, so next week, next week, we're moving from being up against Amanda to deconstructing Harry. And, <laughs> uh, and uh, it's a, uh, it's a film. It's one of my favorite films from one of my favorite directors. And Brian is going to be on that episode talking about it <laughs> with me. Yeah, I will. <laughs> and so get excited. We'll see you next week for that. In the meantime, if you want to get in touch with us and ask us any questions or share your thoughts about this episode, please write to us at contact at the world is wrong podcast.com you can find us on instagram at the world is wrong podcast you can find us uh, uh, on twitter at world is wrong pod there is a page devoted to every episode of this show on the world is wrong podcast and this interview lives on the page devoted to up against amanda which also features the episode about up against amanda and Links to all of Michael's many pages and to where you can track down his films are in the show notes and listed on the page for Up Against Amanda at theworldiswrongpodcast.com. So you can also find Brian doing wonderful things to Francis Ford Coppola with his good friend <laughs> AJ Gonzalez on the director's <laughs> wall. You recently explored... His uh, his third attempt to make a good Godfather film. Uh, <laughs> successful. Third, three successful attempts. I didn't mean to imply that, the, that he, he, was, he got it wrong any of those times. But he took three swings and had three home runs. <laughs> right, Brian? I, I like the third one. <laughs> Not only do I like the third one, I really like your episode 
about the third Good. one. I Good. do take issue with a couple of things you said. Okay. <laughs> they're small. They're minor. Uh, I think you referred to what happened to uh, Michael Corleone's girlfriend. You think you said she died in a car accident in Italy. And that's a little bit more than a car accident. <laughs> she, she was blown up in a bomb that was meant to assassinate Michael. In a car, though. <laughs> I, I don't know. It just sort of buries the lead. It's, it's very... Everybody see The Godfather. Everyone knows what I'm talking I about. Know, but when you said it was a car accident, <laughs> in my mind, I was like, why is he like downplaying that she was blown up? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so polite. It was so weird. Um, and... <laughs> And I totally agree with you guys about the the hairstyles and everything, that it does not yeah, feel like yeah. the 70s. But no. because of that, that's why the thing I, the the, the fact that Elvis Costello's, I think it's Blame It On, uh, Blame It On Kane, they're playing in, yeah. at the Corleone compound. Uh, yeah. And I love that because that's total, that's completely the right music at that time. And yeah. Elvis Costello wasn't that obscure. If you were a cool, like I was, I wasn't cool enough to be into Elvis Costello in 77, but I was definitely, he was in the ether and I saw his album cover at record stores. It wasn't an obscure, it wasn't, anyway, uh, uh, but uh, (laughs) no, but I, so anyway, uh, I recommend that people always check out the Director's Wall episodes, just subscribe to it. Subscribe to it now. They're so much more generous than we are because we demand that you listen to us every week, whereas the Director's Wall only releases an episode like once every six months. And so when it happens, you're just like, oh, it's so exciting. And you get it and you listen to it and then it's done. And then you're just (laughs) waiting for the next one. And then you can listen to this podcast, I guess. So just have a, you know, get on board with it. Get it. Get on board with all of them. And of course, you could also subscribe to the Radio 8 Ball show uh, my other podcast where there are many, 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 many episodes and you can find out all about that at www.radio8ball.com and that's about it so Brian, thank you for yeah. getting up against Amanda with me once again <laughs> and until next time this episode has been proof that You could be in a situation where wherever you are, the world is wrong and it's probably wrong about you. But if you do good stuff and you give it time, the world could get right about you. And that's what happened today. Hi, I'm Brian. And I'm AJ. And we have a podcast called The Director's Wall. Examining a filmmaker's career, film by film. First up was M. Night Shyamalan, then Francis Ford Coppola. Who's next? Is there anything to this whole auteur theory? Find out on The Director's Wall. Subscribe via Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, or your preferred listening platform. Hi, Andras. Oh my goodness. I I hope you don't hate me for this. Um, It turns out after we spoke, I went to look up my friend Brian um, because I was sure that um, he would get a kick out of it, but you know, he's like a, we were friends, like we camped together at Burning Man, but we haven't really been in touch for quite a long time. And, you know, he's married and has a kid and anyway, whatever. So I went to look him up cause I just thought it was funny that I was like assuming in my head that it was him, but his actually, his last name isn't even Connolly. So that's <laughs> what a dummy I am. I am so embarrassed. His last name is Canal. But when I first got the message from you guys and I saw Andras Jones and I saw Brian Connolly, Brian is the only Brian that I know. And 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 we are tangentially attached on you on um Instagram and you guys were mess- messaging me on Instagram. So I just my brain just like took a leap and and then it made sense to me because Um, My Brian is also kind of like a film nerd guy and he even sounds like him and he has a beard and he looks like the the drawing of you, of of Brian, um, your Brian. So um, yeah, it's not even Brian Connolly. I'm so embarrassed. I feel so silly. And now you've made it part of the podcast. So (gasps) I hope that doesn't really screw up your editing or maybe you just want to use this recording as my horrible... (laughs) My horrible apology. I'm so sorry. 
I really am a blonde. I swear to God. Okay, um, yeah, let me know. I'm looking forward to hearing.